So you want to make a multiplayer game, but you don't know how, or it seems like some unsurmountable task that only the true experts can accomplish. Well, stop that thinking because I'm going to teach you how to make your own multiplayer game super easily in Unity using their new netcode for game objects framework. And in the next video, I'll be teaching you how to host your own server on the internet and implement matchmaking so you can actually have people join your game all over the world. And so with this, you'll be able to start on your journey to make your dream multiplayer game in no time. So with Unity, the possibilities are endless. There's been multiple popular multiplayer games made with Unity, such as Fall Guys, Among Us, and more. And so essentially, we have two parts to cover. We have the netcode for game objects, which is the actual framework that we're going to use to implement multiplayer within Unity. And then we have UGS, which stands for Unity Gaming Services. And with this, they provide a variety of services for multiplayer games that make the development much more easier. These include lobby, matchmaking, voice chat, server hosting, authentication, monetization, analytics, and cloud content delivery. So you can patch your game if there's any problems without impacting the player experience. And so if you haven't guessed it already, this video is sponsored by Unity. <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into it. A lot of tutorials start with the code straight out. However, I want to go over some terminology if you're especially new to networking and might not know what some of these things mean. But there are timestamps in the video so you can skip ahead to the code part if this is already within your knowledge. All right, so we're going to go over some terminology, then we're going to go hands on with the code. And then in the next video, we'll be going over hosting and matchmaking with UGS. So first of all, what is networking? Essentially, it's just a system of two or more computers linked together. That's it. That's all it is. <laughs> but there are a lot of different type of architecture systems once you go down the weeds of networking. And I'll be covering one of the basic ones today. All right. So what is a server? Well, a server just provides some sort of service to another computer and it can store information. So for example, YouTube runs on a server. All of this video content is getting stored on a server and all of the services that YouTube provides also runs on a server. And as the user accessing YouTube, you would be considered the client. Now the internet is essentially a whole conglomeration of servers communicating with each other and passing information from one server to another. And so each server has an IP address, which looks something like this, which you might have seen before. And essentially it's a unique identifier, which helps for identification of this device on the network. So let's say this server wants to communicate with this server. Well, then this server would have to know this server's IP address to be able to send information from one server to another. And now we have the client, which essentially just requests information from a server to access it and use it in some way. And a client also has an IP address. Then there's a cool little thing called a host, which we're actually going to be using for our example. And essentially it's a server and a client combined. And so for testing, this makes things a lot easier in our case, because now we don't really have to spin up a server instance of our game. Now you can have a host, which essentially runs the server, but they also act as a client and can play their own game or use their own service. So we have a server, we have a client. How exactly do these two communicate? Do they just send magical waves across the universe and expect the other computer to pick it up? Well, kind of. First, let's think about what happens if you want to send someone mail. If the package is too big for the mailbox, it's not going to fit. And the receiver will either have to get a bigger mailbox or you'll have to leave it in front of their front door. <laughs> so in networking, there's things called packets, which is essentially bits of information that are sent over the network that contain the information that either the server or the client needs to function. So basically we're breaking up that big message into little packets. And it's important to understand these concepts so that when making a game with networking, you're able to solve problems much easier. So what does a packet consist of? Essentially we have the header, which has the basic information like who sent this package and also what's the order of this package because let's say a server is communicating with a client and sending 20 packets the client needs to know what order the packets are in to put them together so the message is coherent then we have the payload which is actually the information contained within the packet so essentially the internet is just this flurry of servers and clients communicating with each other through these packets and it's quite a magical process if you ask me 
But how do these actually send the packets? And this is called a transport layer. And we're going to be using this to transmit data from our server to our client and vice versa. Essentially, I like to think about it like a little tube that transports information from one location to another. A transport layer is also responsible for error correction and providing quality and reliability to the end user. For example, some packets may get lost on transport and there are different transport protocols that depending on which one you use, one might be more secure, another one might be faster. And so I'll cover these in the next couple of slides. So as I said, I like to think of it as a little tube that kind of facilitates the transport of information from one server to another server or to a client and vice versa. And so the two biggest ones you might have heard of are UDP and TCP. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. UDP is much more fast. However, it is less reliable because it kind of just shoots out all of the messages. As you see here, it just kind of shoots them all out and hopes that the receiver gets all of the messages without any confirmation. Then we have TCP, which is the Transmission Control Protocol. It is more reliable because it actually verifies that all of the packets have been received. However, because it has to verify that each package has been received, it is much slower. Basically, once this guy sends a package to this guy, did you get the package? And this guy is like, no, I didn't get the second package. And then this guy is like, oh my God, I need to resend the package. And I'm just doodling all over the place. But And so essentially, it will retransmit the lost package. It's kind of like relationships. They talk to each other and communicate if something's been lost in the communication process. <laughs> all right, so let's do a simple example. Imagine we have two people playing a game. In this case, these are two clients, and then we have a server. How does one client communicate with the other client that their character is moving position? Well, we would send the position to the server, and then the server would relay the position to the other client. And so the server kind of acts like a middleman between all of the clients. And so let's say we have a host instead, and a host is the server and the client. So this is running both the server of the game and it's also running a client. And let's say we want to communicate the position to another client. Since we don't have a middleman anymore, we can just send the position directly from the host to the other client and vice versa. The other client can communicate with the host. And this is kind of more of a peer to peer architecture. So the peers are communicating with no server middlemen. There's a few more concepts I want to discuss. And while we code, I'll be discussing even more in depth. But there's a concept such as authoritative and essentially it's who's in charge and who has the final say in a system. So we have server authoritative, which is the default with Unity and a lot of games. And essentially it's the server that makes all the final gameplay decisions. And so this is good for consistency and security. However, the downside is that you need to wait for the server to process information from the client to then update the client and all of the other clients. So this can actually lead to some lag up front on your side if you have to keep sending positions to the server and then the server has to say, okay, you can move to that position. And then once you get that confirmation, then you can move. Then there's a client authoritative architecture, which is that the client kind of decides what they wanna do and they own essentially their reality. So they don't need to wait for the server if they move they move at the moment, they just decide to send the position to the server after they move. So essentially, they don't have to wait for the server for any confirmation. They just move and they tell the server, look, I moved. It's up to you to update the other clients. And so the problem with this is that it's harder to maintain consistency because now this client's in charge of his world and what he sees might not be exactly what another client is seeing. And so there's also issues with security because it can be easier for clients to hack the game by maybe making it easier for them to shoot, making the player faster, because now the server isn't checking anything. And so there's actually fixes that we can do so that we can maintain the server authoritative architecture, but also update the client so that it's not lagging. And that goes into the weeds of things such as client side prediction. However, just know that there are definitely ways to maintain that server authority, but also to make sure the client isn't experiencing any lag. And so here's a quick summary. We have the server authority, which is more secure, but less reactive. And 
essentially there's no synchronization issues because all the clients should be seeing the same thing. And then we have the client authority, which is less secure, can have synchronization issues, but it does feel more reactive and smooth for the player. Some other quick concepts I want to cover are lag and latency. So when you're transmitting a message, there is some delay because it has to travel over the network. It doesn't just go through there instantaneously. And so latency is essentially the amount of time between a cause and the visible effect. So how much time it takes to transmit information from this guy to this guy. One possible fix is interpolation, which makes the game appear smoother by applying math functions like lerping, slurping. And this is essentially done on the client side. So for example, let's say a server is sending information to a client. However, the client receives two position points, one here and one over here. You're not just going to teleport the client from this location to this location because it will look rather odd. Instead, you're going to smoothly interpolate from one location to another location. So the movement can remain more smooth and it doesn't look like there's as much lag. And so that's a basic overview of some networking concepts that I think are very important. And so I'll be going over some others while we cover NGO, which is Netcode for Game Object, Unity's new multiplayer solution, which is pretty amazing. And so for a quick overview of what Unity can provide, here we have the client and the server, and these run on Netcode for Game Objects. Then we have Unity's network transport layer, so we can use that to send information between the client and the server. And then Unity has extra services that it provides, such as matchmaking, identity, persistent data across worlds, and management of servers. So hosting a server, scaling a server, it automatically scales servers depending on your needs and the ability to update servers. And this exists outside of netcodes. However, they can be used together rather well. And so netcode is generally recommended for smaller games and less intensive games. So if you need a game with super complicated physics calculations and a lot of players, I would also look into netcode for entities, which is their netcode, but essentially for ECS structure, dots structure, which can provide a lot more performance upfront and is designed for these complicated physics. That's not to say it's impossible in netcode, but generally Unity recommends netcode for smaller to medium sized games. And before we dive into the code, there's two samples that Unity has that I want to make you aware of. One of them is Boss Room and it's the more complete sample and it's more of a co-op game, which is fully server authoritative. And then the Galactic Kitten sample is a 2D sample that is mostly server authoritative, but has client authoritative movement. And so be sure to check these out if you want more details and more examples on Unity Netcode. And so I want to make this known that networking is a mindset and you're going to really have to open up your mind and think about how you're coding these scripts in a different way than you're used to. It's not impossible, but it's definitely difficult because you have to change the way you think about how the scripts are interacting with each other. And with this sample, you'll learn exactly how to do that. So this is what we are going to create. I know it looks like a lot now. I have three different editor instances open of Unity so we can test it much more easily. Back in the day, you had to build each time you wanted to test the client and the server connection. However, now you have tools such as Parallel Sync and Unity has their own called MPPM multiplayer play mode, which also does something similar. However, since this recently came out and it is a little unstable from my testing experiences, we'll be going with parallel sync, which is what you see here. We have three instances of Unity open. All right, so we press play on all the instances and I click on the server. You'll see some weird stuff pop up and that's because these triangles are actually little food. And if I go into another editor here and I click client, then you'll see this little guy kind of wandering around. And if you eat the little red food, you grow. So it's kind of like Slither IO. If you played that game, it's a pretty popular IO game. And the idea is to grow bigger as a snake and then destroy your opponents. So if I go to the other client and I press on that client button, you'll see that I can see the other guy here. And the movement is perfectly synchronized between the two clients. And if I eat a food, you'll see that on the other client, It'll also update the length of the tail. And if I switch over to the other client, everything will be synchronized. You'll see there is a little bit of lag when there is moving. And this is because everything here is server authoritative. 
which means that because there's extra checks going on and the movement has to be sent to the server and back to the clients, there is a tad of a delay. But I'll also show you how to do client movement so it'll be faster and also ways to circumvent this lag. And so what happens if we eat the other snake? You'll see that at the bottom left we have the length of the snake. If we go and eat the snake, bam, the other snake, which has less length, will die. Unfortunately, that is how life is. So put on your seatbelts and hold on because we are about to start making your first multiplayer game. So first, let's start by creating a new project. You can choose whichever template you want. I will recommend 2D for this or 2D URP, and you can name this slither.io for whatever you want. Now, it is important to note you do need minimum Unity version 2020.3. I definitely recommend 2021.3, this one right here, which is LTS, long-term support, and it is the most stable version. And you need to either have mono or IL2 CVP as the scripting backend, which is the default. And currently it works on all of these platforms. If you're interested in WebGL, it technically works according to the documentation. However, there is a bug and it says they recommend version 1.3.0, which doesn't seem to be out yet. However, just keep an eye out for when WebGL support is fully compatible. All right, so just click create project. All right, and so just go ahead and create that project and it's gonna take quite a while to load up and that's okay. Feel free to get some coffee while you're waiting or juice, if you don't drink coffee. All right, so first of all, we need some packages. So we go to window package manager and then under packages, Unity registry. And so if you're in version 2023, or I haven't tested 2022, but you can actually scroll down. This is 2023, as you can see, I can scroll down and netcode for game objects will actually be there. You can install that directly. But since it's not in this list, let's install it manually. So click this plus button, then add package by name, and then we can copy this on the documentation. Basically it's com.unity.netcode.gameobjects. And all we wanna do is then just paste that and add that to the project. And so it will add it to the project just through the name, which is pretty neat. And then you might see this message, which we have to restart the editor and just click OK for the changes to take effect. All right, just ignore all these errors. These are weird package manager errors that I get sometimes. And so another package we want to install here is add package by name. And then we want to add in com.unity.multiplayer.tools. So just type that in and then click add. And so essentially, this is an extra package provided by Unity, the multiplayer tools package that will give us some extra little neat components that we can use to help debug our game more efficiently. So it comes with a network profiler so we can profile how much data and what data is being sent through our transport layer. They also have runtime network stats. There's also a network simulator where you can test different network conditions and lag. And there's this newer one that I was mentioning, the multiplayer play mode, which lets us simulate multiple clients and servers in the Unity editor itself, which if you like, you can go and install this. It only works with 2023.1 or later. And I found that some of the console.logs weren't updating on one editor. So I would personally recommend to use Parallel Sync for now until the tool is a little more stable. All right, and once that has been downloaded, now we can start our merry little journey. So there's one thing that we absolutely need for a networked game and that's a network manager. So let's right click and create an empty game object and let's just call this network manager. And we're gonna go all the way to the right side and then add a network manager. And this manages, you guessed it, the network. So this manages the server, the clients, the hosts. It manages the networked objects in the scene. It's in charge of spawning the networked objects, of despawning the networked object and keeping track of the game state for the network. So there's a couple of things we want to do here. First, we want to select a transport. Let's just click Unity Transport. And remember the transport is what's basically sending the packets of information from a client to a server and vice versa. And so you'll see here that we have some parameters that we can play around with, adjusting the size of the packets, the size of the payloads, timeout sizes, timeout milliseconds, so what happens if a connection cannot be established within a thousand milliseconds? The timeout milliseconds of a heartbeat, which is essentially just a periodic signal sent between the two endpoints to make sure that the endpoints are still active. How many connection attempts there can be? How much time has to pass for a client to be disconnected? And if you open these two up, you can see 
our server will be running at an address of 127.0.0.1 which is localhost and localhost is just our local machine and then the port is very important this is how the clients will know where they need to go to be able to connect to the server so essentially it's the endpoint for sending and receiving data and then we have a debug simulator which you can actually simulate delay and jitter and drops of the packets so delay is how much time it takes from going to one place to another and then jitter adds in some random variation all right back to the network manager you'll see that we have some settings here the important ones are enable scene management so if you don't have this checked you'll have to manage the scenes manually and you'll have to change the scenes for the player whenever they are supposed to enter a new scene however if this is checked then unity will automatically take care of that for you so if the clients need to enter a new scene when some event happens then this takes care of that scene synchronization between the different clients then there is spawning so up here you'll see that we have a player prefab and this is cool because we can put in a default player prefab that will spawn whenever a client connects and that's what you put in here and we'll be using this with the network prefab section this is important you need to put all prefabs that are going to be networked within this list so essentially we also need to add our player prefab into the network prefab i tried doing it without adding it to the network prefab to see if it would work and it did not work in my case so just to be safe we're going to add the player prefab into this list and our food which is also networked because you saw that the food is synchronized between the two players we'll also be putting the food in this list the tick rate is essentially how often netcode runs the code and sends out data so it's how often the game state is updated it's similar to how in unity you have a frame that is called ever so often but with the network you have a tick rate which is called ever so often to make sure that everything is synchronized a higher tick rate generally means more responsive and smoother experience however that does require more power and bandwidth which can be both resource intensive for the server and the clients. A network variable will be going over this soon. Essentially, it's a variable that's synced between the clients and the server. And so I haven't touched this setting. However, this lets you read from a network variable even if a client writes to it when it's not allowed to. Connection approval will actually be implementing. And this essentially is a function that has to approve clients before adding them into the server. And this is so that just not anyone can join, but you have a vetting process. And basically you decide whether this client should be able to join your match. And you can also use this to spawn different prefabs for each player and do some pre-processing before the player is spawned in. And you'll see down here we have start host, start server, and start client. So we can click these buttons to start different instances directly on this component. All right, still following along? Good, because this is just the start. So we're going to start off by making a player prefab so let's right click and create a folder and let's just call this prefabs and so we're going to right click on the hierarchy and create a 2d object sprite circle and we're going to make this circle whatever color you want i'm just going to do it pink even though i showed it blue previously but i like pink too and so we're also going to add as a child more 2d objects so right click on the parent 2d object sprites and circle and so let's make this one smaller. If you make it smaller, press shift to keep it uniform. And you zoom in and just put it somewhere at the front. And these are going to be the eyeballs. And I changed my mind. I don't want pink. It is a little distracting. So you can click one of the circles, control C, control V, and then just copy them over. And then I'm just going to copy it again and make one of them smaller, make it black. So these will be the little eyeballs. And this is so we can know what's our forward direction. It's more as a visual cue for us. And we'll also be adding a nice little blink animation. So we have our cute little snake here. Let's click on the parent F2 to rename it and call it player. And then let's just drag that into the prefabs folder. And so you'll see that there is a tad little problem. And that's because the sprites are not being sorted correctly. So make sure that the sorting is correct. For the children, let's just click the sprite render, order and layer, and set each of them to one. And then the black pupils, let's set the order to two. So this just makes sure that these sprites are rendered in front of each other. And so if we replace our prefab, you can just go to the overrides and click apply all. And you'll see it will update here. We can now remove it from the scene. And then we can drag in our player prefab into the network manager and also drag it into the network prefabs list. You'll see that we get an error 
cannot register the prefab because it does not have a network object component at its root. And that is true. So we have to go into our prefabs under the player. Let's add that in so it doesn't throw that error. Network object. So any object that needs to be networked in our scene must have the network object script or else it will not work. This is super important. And so let's just clear that error. Now let's go through some of these settings here. So always replicate as root. This is important. So this component is usually attached to the parent that you want to be networked and not the children. The children always follow the parent. So if the parent has a network object, the children will also be networked. Now, this essentially means that the children, when they get replicated on the other clients, they will not be replicated as children. They'll be replicated as the root and the parent will be ignored. And this means that the children will not follow the parent's positions and rotation transform component like it normally does. It will follow the world coordinate system. Now, we're not going to use that in this video. However, this might be useful in some scenarios where the object's parent is not replicated or does not need to exist on the clients, but you still want the objects and its children to be correctly positioned on the scene. And this essentially enables parent synchronization so that the children will be automatically synchronized with the parent. Don't destroy with owner basically means that when the owner of this object is destroyed, then if it's false, which is currently false right now, then the network object should also be destroyed. But if you check this, then the ownership of this object is transferred to the server when the owner is destroyed. All right, that was a lot of information. Hopefully you're still here and kicking. So let's actually make it possible to move our player around. And so before we do this, we'll actually need to install Parallel Sync so we can test this. So if we just go to Parallel Sync on GitHub, the link is in the description as well. And we just go up here, down here to releases. Then we can click on the .unity package and you can just drag and drop that into your Unity scene and then just click import and then all the magic will happen. And so there is an error here and I can just click clear like a good developer does. <laughs> all right. And then for parallel sync, let's go to the clones manager up top and let's just start and create a new clone. So this creates a new editor instance of the one we currently have and it actually syncs up to the main editor whenever we make a change. So it's very smart. And I decided to do that now because this will take some time. We only need one to start right now, but later on we will make a second clones manager. So if you also just want to create that other clone now, then go ahead and use the restroom or any other things that you want to do in this time. All right. And now in my case, I'm just going to just add that other clone and just have that ready. All right. And now once that's done, you can just go ahead and open the new editor. All right. And now once that's done and we have another instance opened, you'll see that now we have two instances running. Pretty cool. So now let's go into our project and let's right click and create a new folder. We're going to call that underscore scripts. And now we can just click that and right click and then let's create our C sharp script player controller. And let's just double click that and it will open up our IDE which I switched to writer. Oopsies. <laughs> All right. And so some things that we're going to want to do here. And so I know we just opened this up, but I just want to show you what happens when we start our server. And so I actually went ahead and restarted my editor because I was getting some weird burst compiler errors. And I read online that that fix was just to restart your editor. So if you're seeing that, just restart the editor. And so once we actually press play, you'll see that the network manager is now under the do not destroy on load. So this essentially keeps the object alive through multiple scenes. And if we start the host, you'll see that now our little cute guy is spawned and a player is now on the scene. And so remember that the host is both the server and the client at once. So if we actually just click the server here, our player wouldn't spawn because it is not a client itself. And so let's click host here. And now in the other instance that I have open, I'm going to click play. I'm going to open up this network manager and I'm going to start the client. And so now you'll see that we have two characters here. We go into our scene view and I move one of them a little bit to the right. You'll see that now there's two characters and in the host, you'll see that we have two characters as well. So the characters are correctly being spawned, which is important. Make sure that this step works before continuing. 
All right, so back into our script. I'm going to erase this because I like to start fresh. And then I'm just going to erase these two using statements and add them as needed. So the first step is that this is not a regular mono behavior. Since it's a networked object, we now have to make it inherit from a network behavior, which lets us call all of the functions from mono behavior as usual. It just adds some extra niceties. So let's start with movement. So let's make an update function. And we're going to start with client authoritative movement because it's much easier to show right off the bat. And the code is very similar to normal movement in a non-networked environment. So to move our character, first we need to get our mouse position. And so I'm going to be using the old input system just for this example, because with parallel sync and with the new Unity MPPM, I was having a little issue with the mouse position. It wasn't getting registered correctly on the different editor instances. And I'm sure that's just a networking debug issue with the multiple editor instances running at once that the mouse position is having a hard time trying to figure out where it is. But not to worry, we'll just use the old one and get the mouse position. Essentially, we want to move our character towards where our mouse is. And so let's just do input dot mouse position and which and this is a vector two. Now the mouse position is in screen coordinates, which is essentially like the resolution of your screen. And we want this to be in world coordinates so that it maps to the correct position in the scene view where the snake is supposed to move to. So with that, we can just do vector three and we can do mouse world coordinates and we can use the main camera function screen to world point, which I'll just put an initialize function here, initialize and let's cache this. So we're going to do private camera, main camera. And essentially this is just so we don't have to keep calling camera.main constantly and we can cache that value. So main camera equals camera.main. And this is a reference to our main camera on our scene, which you have to make sure is tagged as main camera. So why am I not calling it in start or awake function? Well, you'll see that in just a bit. For now, let's just finish this update function. So we can do main camera dot screen to world point and we can pass in the mouse position in screen. And one little caveat of this function is we have to pass in the Z position or the Z value of this vector, which is essentially the distance from the camera's near clip plane to the floor, which in essentially our floor is going to be zero because if we put our player here, you'll see that it's at zero, zero, zero. Our Z will be zero. It's in 2D. We only want to move the X and Y. And so for this function to work properly, and convert the screen coordinates to world coordinates, it needs to take into account the perspective. And for that, it needs to know the distance from the camera to wherever it needs to project our screen coordinate to. And so for that, we're actually gonna change this around just a little bit. And up here, we're going to define a private vector three mouse input. And so that's so we don't have to keep making a new vector three constantly because this update method will run quite a bit. So we can do mouse input dot x equals input dot mouse position dot x. I'm going to press shift alt and then down to duplicate that. Let's erase line 17 here and let's replace x with y. And now we can do mouse position dot z equals underscore main camera dot near clip plane, which the near clip plane is essentially the little rectangle at the start of the camera projection. And the far clip plane is the furthest rectangle. And this essentially clips all of the objects that are not in our view out so that the renderer doesn't need to waste time rendering objects that the camera can't see. And so if we use the near clipping plane, then the distance is the near clipping plane. Now let's move the player towards that position. So we can do transform dot position equals, we can do vector three move towards and move towards is we move from the current position to our target position, which is the mouse world coordinates. And then we do it at a certain step or essentially the distance to move per call. And for this, we want to use time dot delta time. So it's smoothed out over the frames. And then we can multiply it by some speed variable that we'll define up here. So we can do a serialized field, serialized field. So it appears in the inspector. And then we can do private close speed and we can set that to three. And it's private because we don't need any other script to be changing this value. Want to keep good coding standards like a good coder. <laughs> and we're going to replace here the mouse position screen with our mouse input variable that we made. And so this is for the movement movement. 
Now we also want to rotate it towards our mouse position. So rotation, and we only want to rotate it if we're moving. So we can just do a quick check. So if the current coordinates are not equal to our transform top position, then let's rotate towards wherever we're moving. And so for rotation, essentially we want to find out the direction that we want to rotate in. So what direction should we rotate in? And we want to rotate in the direction of our target. So we can just do some simple vector math, mouse world coordinates minus transform dot position. So this will return a vector with the origin at the transform position pointing towards the mouse world coordinates, which is our destination. And then we can just set the transform up of our character to our target direction. So transform up is like transform dot forward, but this is in 2D. Forward is in the Z axis and we only are working in the X and Y. All right. And one last thing we want to add just to make our lives a little easier. Let's add an if here. If the application dot is focused, if it's not focused, so negate that, then return. So essentially this makes it so that we have to be on that editor to move that character and it will just help us with testing it out on multiple editors. All right, so if we go back into our editor, let's go into our prefabs and add a player controller. Now, if you actually spawn this, nothing will happen. So if you go and you start the host, nothing will happen, right? Apart from the fact that I completely forgot to call this initialize function. So let's just initialize this. And so we don't want to do it on start. Let's do it on network spawn. So when this object is spawned, then let's initialize it. So sometimes this on network spawn will be called before the start functions. And so the main camera doesn't really matter. In this case, we can just do that on awake. But if you do this in start, the first time this update runs, it might not have a reference to your camera. So just to be on the safe side, let's do it when this player is spawned. Let's initialize it. And you can see on the Unity documentation, when an object is dynamically spawned, first awake is called, then on network spawn, then start. If it's already placed in the scene, awake, then start, then on network spawn is called. So just be sure of these differences when you're creating objects. to Make sure you don't have any null references. So we're going to spawn that. And again, to my previous example, if I start a host, you'll see that it does move. There's a little issue here, but that's okay. We'll fix that. However, if we spawn in that client, See, if we spawn in our client, now both of these are moving with the same mouse input, which is incorrect. We want each player to control their snake individually. And then there's another problem. You see how the host, when we play on the client, it isn't being updated on the host because the client isn't actually sending its position to the host or the server. It's just moving locally. So we have to send our position to the server. And so how do we do that? We use Network transforms. Network transforms let you send the position, rotation, and scale of your transform to the server automatically, which is pretty neat. Now, the network transform component, this is for server owned game objects. So, this actually won't work because this game object will be owned by the client. So, what do we do in this case? Well, Unity figured that out and wrote an extra script for us the client network transform script. Now you can add in a new package to get this script by adding this git URL and you'll need to have git installed, or we can just copy this script here, which I'll have the link in the description and we'll call this client network transform. So if you go to the assets and right click and create a new C sharp script, client network transform, transform, we click that and we just copy that in. Essentially all it's doing is overriding this is server authoritative and making it false. So now the client can move itself. And when the client moves itself, this results in a much faster feedback for the player that they are moving. And it also synchronizes the movement on the server to all of the clients. So we can do client network transform and just copy that there. And so you'll see that here, we wanna make sure to only check what we need to be sent, right? We don't wanna be sending information that we don't need because information is valuable in a network and there's going to be a lot of objects being synced constantly so you want to optimize it and only send what you actually need so in this case we don't need to change the scale of the object we only need to send the x and the y because we're only moving in two dimensions and then we're only going to want to be rotating on the z axis so we only need to send these three values 
And we also want to make sure to select interpolate. So this will make sure that the movement is smoother. So instead of you being here and then suddenly you're here, it slowly interpolates over that distance and moves smoothly. Thresholds essentially only send information if a certain threshold has been reached. So if the position change is more than 0 0.001, then it will send the information. If not, it won't. So adjust these values as according to your game or app. So you don't need to send more information than needed. This is for the rotation. So it only sends information if the rotation threshold is higher than 105 and then the scale threshold. By default, this synchronizes in world space. However, if you want to synchronize the transform in local space, you can just click this nice little button here. So we click play and start the host. Obviously, there's something wrong with the rotation. We're going to fix that in one minute, but let's start the other editor instance and we go into the network manager and we start our client and you'll see that now the client is sending the information to the host or the server and you'll see that the positions are being matched exactly. So you'll see that if I move the host here, then the host is replicated on this other system. All right, so let's fix this jankiness. So you saw that it was being replicated, but I can still control the other player, which isn't what you want, right? You want to be able to control your own player. So there's two issues, the jankiness of the rotation, and we can actually still control the other player. So even if the positions are getting updated and sent to the server, we're still controlling both players. And so let's fix the jankiness first. First, I'm going to initialize the mouse input to vector 3.0 just because sanity reasons. And so the fix for this jankiness is that essentially I forgot in the target direction to set this Z value to zero. And this will fix any of that weird rotation issue. And essentially when we want to rotate around the Z axis, we have to make sure to set this target direction Z to zero or else the incorrect axis will be rotated around. And so to fix the issue that both clients are getting moved with one player input, it's relatively simple because we derive from network behavior, we have some properties exposed to us that we can benefit from. So in this if statement, we want to check if we are the owner of this script. So you can just type is owner. You'll see that there's a couple other properties like is this a client? Is this a host? Is this a server? Is this a spawned network object? Is this the local player? Is it owned by the server, etc. So in our case, we want to be is owner or if the application isn't focused. So here we're saying if we're not the owner of this script attached to this game object or the application isn't focused, then we return. So what does this actually mean? So let's play this and you'll see that it will be fixed. And I will explain to you what this means because this is rather confusing. So you see that our rotation's fine. That works great. Now, if we go to the other instance and we press play and we go to the network manager and then we start the client, you'll see that now I can move this snake and the other snake isn't moving, which is the correct behavior, right? We only want to be able to move one character, the character that you own. So what does it mean to own an object in a network? Well, that's where I said where the mindset is very important in networking because the way these scripts are executed are fundamentally different than you would usually be used to making single player games. Because this is a network behavior, when you start a host, you'll see that a player here is spawned. And when you start the client, another player is spawned. And so now there's two players in the scene. And so on this client, we have two players and both of those players have a player controller. So the player controller is running on both of these game objects locally. And it's also running on the host locally on both players. So essentially, if you're client number one, you're going to be executing this player controller for player number one and player number two. And this can come up with some difficulties because as you saw, once we move our character in one code, that actually gets executed on both because this is running on both game objects. And so with a network behavior, we can actually query to see if this network object is the owner of this player controller script. And with that, we can check who's the owner and what code should be ran. And so I do have a little visual for you as well so that it can help you out. So we have our server here and let's say we have two clients and each client 
is running both a player controller and a player length script, which actually will make that script soon. Now let's say we are client one. We'll need to run both client one's code and client's two code, which contains both the player controller and the player length. Now, here are some of the variables on each of those codes. So let's say we're client one and we're running our client one player controller. So our network object layer. In this case, is owner would be set to true and is client would be set to true. On the second client, however, is owner would be set to false and is client would still be set to true because it's also a client. Now let's say we have a server and two clients. If we're client one, the values would remain the same. However, is server would be false because we're not the server. However, if we are the server, the server returns is owner is false, is client is false, and is server is true. However, the server is also running this code because this is spawning on the server as well. So with is owner, we can basically check who owns each script. And so essentially, we already have a multiplayer networked game running. Now you'll see we keep having to go here and starting the host and the server. So let's make a helper function to make it easier for us to start the host and the server. So for that, we're going to make a canvas UI canvas, and I'm just going to set the scaler to scale with screen size 1920 by 1080. So the UI scales with the resolution. Then let's right click a UI text mesh pro button, and then let's import the TMP essentials. And so this will just make it easier for us. So in the button, Let's click this little square here, then press shift and alt and top left corner. So it will pivot it and position it in the top left corner. And we can also check this little lock here and increase the scale uniformly. I'm going to click this drop down and name this host. I'm going to click the button F2 host button. Then I'm going to control D to duplicate that and call this the server button server button. And I'm going to drag it downwards. And for that text, I'm just going to put server and then duplicate that one and call it client button. And we're going to call this one client. And let's drag the client button under the server button. And under assets scripts, let's create a new script and let's call it start network. We can double click that and let's make some functions that we need. We don't need these two using statements. Let's do public void start server. And so to start the server, we can do network manager dot singleton because this is a singleton this is a static instance that's globally accessible then we can just do start server and we can just copy this function and paste it two more times instead of server here i'm just going to click server then press control d and put client and down here do the same thing control d and put host so essentially we're just starting the host and clients and erase these two using statements and you'll also need the using unity dot net code namespace to be able to access the network manager singleton and if we go back into our unity scene let's add this script to the canvas so under the canvas let's add the start network script then for each one of our buttons we're going to go in and add an on click event and for the canvas we can drag that in and then call our start network in this case start host let's make a new event here canvas start network start server then for the client button drag in the canvas, start network, start client. And then let's select all of these with shift and clicking and the first one and then the last one. And let's add a new event. Let's drag in the canvas and then let's do canvas rule enabled and leave that unchecked. So this will remove the canvas after we've clicked the button. So you see, if we click play, we can just click host and now it starts and we don't have to go into the network manager, which can, which can be a little bit of a time waster. All right, so moving on. We're going to be adding the food and also making the player grow as they collect food. Before that, I just want to show you how to add animations and have them synced over the network, which is pretty easy. So if you go into our prefabs, our player prefab, essentially all we have to do is have obviously an animator with our animations. And then we have to have a network animator component attached to our network object. And so then we can just drag in our animator into that network animator field. And so let's go ahead and make an animator. I'm going to lock in the inspector on the top right. Click this lock icon so this doesn't go anywhere. Then let's right click and create a new folder and we can just call this animations. And then we can right click and create an animator if we go all the way down animator controller. And we can just call this player animator. You can actually drag that into our animator. And so now we actually need an animation 
So we're going to double click our player. We're going to go to window animation animation. And now let's create an animation clip once we've selected our player and let's save that under our animations folder and let's just call it blink. So essentially we're just going to make the eyes blink, which it's circle two and circle three. So I'm just going to add a property circle two. I'm going to add the transform property and essentially we're going to change the scale of our circle. So click this red button and it starts recording it basically keeps track of what movements you're making. So right around here, we can set the scale of the Y to a lower value like 0.1 and you can just drag that and copy it here so it's staying blinked for some time. And then we can copy these values and paste them maybe around 30 seconds. And I'm not really going too depth into this because it's just animation. And you'll see we have this like kind of cool blinking. Might be better to make it a little smaller like 0 0.07 and make this one 0 0.07. And so then let's add a property for the third circle as well. Let's transform the scale. And, and we can actually copy the circle two values here and we can paste them in circle three. If we select circle three, we can paste those values and you'll see that it's now blinking. Wow. If we press 2D, we can see it clear. All right, and then just click that little record button so it's done. Just make sure to save this. And so then we go into our animator and the blink should be there. If it's not, you can just drag it in and set it as the default. So that's how to basically sync animations over the server. If we test it out and we start the host, you'll see that we are blinking. Wow, amazing gameplay, 10 out of 10, never before seen. And the parallel sync clones do take a little time to update. So just click reload scene when that comes up and let's join as the client. And you'll see that both are blinking at the same exact time, um, but <laughs> You get the point. All right, so that's how to sync animations, which is pretty easy. Now let's actually make the player's tail grow. Now this is a chicken and an egg problem. Should we start with the tail or the food? In this case, I'm gonna start with growing the tail because I think it would be much easier for you to understand explaining it this way. So let's do it like that. So let's create a new script. and Let's call that player length. And so this script will be on our player. So in our player, let's just add a player length component, player length. And remember to unlock this in the inspector if you don't want that open all the time. Double click it. I'm going to erase these two functions. I'm going to erase the two using statements that we do not need. All right. This is also going to be a network behavior. So be sure to make that a network behavior. And we do need it to be using unity.net code. So in this one, I might have missed saying that because writer adds it for me automatically. So apologies for that. However, you do need the using unity.net code namespace in order for all of this to work. And I'm going to remove this using system from the player controller since we're not using it. All right. So this is a tad tricky to say the least. Essentially, we want to keep track of our length. So how long is our snake? But we also want other players to know how long our snake is. So the snake is updated on their instance. Now, each length is going to be a circle that's attached to our player. Now, you could take the easy way out and make the circle a child of the player. However, that means that the children of the player, since the player is a networked object, the network will have to send over the positions of the children. And so it's sending more information. And so imagine if our snake has like 50 circles following it and the network will have to be sending this information constantly. When in reality, all we need to know is where is the head and how long is a snake? When you have that information, the other clients can be responsible for mimicking the position, the tail. And so this means in this case, this is not fully server authoritative because the server isn't setting the positions for absolutely every object on the scene. And it is a trade-off. You have to decide, do I want everything to be owned by the server? Do I want things to be owned and managed by the client? What does my game need? In this case, I'm going to be showing you how to essentially transmit the length and have the other clients update the snakes depending on length. And this complexity makes it a very good example. So you can learn how the networking works. So let's begin. We know where the head is because the head has a client network transform component attached, but we need to keep track of our length. And luckily Unity has something called network variables that we can use. So let's define a network variable, network variable. 
So a network variable is synced across all instances. So you don't need to send custom events or RPCs, which are remote procedure calls. And I'll cover those later in the video, which basically are functions run on either the server or the client. You don't need to do that. You can just do a network variable. And once you update this variable, it will be synced across all the clients. And so here we put in the type. Normally you can put an integer, right? But let's keep in performance in mind. Let's do a U short instead. Let's call this length. A U short is essentially an unsigned int 16. Unsigned because it will always be positive and int 16, it can support two to the 16 bytes. And so it is smaller than a normal integer and will be enough for our case. And so we can initialize this network variable with new, and then we can pass in a value. We can either pass in a default value, which is zero, or we can pass in one. So let's pass in one because our current length is one, which is our head. Now by default, this is server authoritative. So only the server can change this value, which is what we're going to do. However, what if you want the client to be able to change this value? Well, you can override the permissions. You can see that we have a read permission and a write permission here. Read permission and write permission. So you can do network variable read permission, everyone. So everyone can read this or only the owner of this network objects can read it. And then you can set a write permission either to the owner or the server. So with this, you can have it so that the owner can change the network variable and that would make it more client authoritative. By default, this is set to everyone and server. So this is the default, but I'm going to leave it there. All right. So we have our length here and now we need a list of our tails. So let's keep a private list of game object tails. And let's also get a reference to a prefab that we're going to make private game object body ball prefab. So this will be spawned when we eat a food and when we increase our length with the list, we'll need to import system.collections.generic. And we'll also be using some other values that we'll add later on. All right, so let's do an on network spawn. Let's initialize our list. So tails equals new list of game objects. And now let's make a private void function to instantiate the ball. Instantiate ball. So essentially, we're going to instantiate one of the tails. So maybe instantiate tail would actually be a better name and have that follow the player. So we can do game object tail equals instantiate and let's call this the tail prefab not the body ball prefab that's a weird name so let's instantiate the tail prefab at the current position and with quaternion.identity and so you'll notice this instantiates a local version so this is not a networked object this is just a normal game object and then we can do tails.add tail now there's a lot of more stuff we have to do in between this function However, let's go and make that prefab. Let's create a new prefab and let's call this tail. Double click that and let's add a right render with a circle. So click this little button here and let's search up circle. It's not coming up. So let's actually just add it here. For some reason, it doesn't show up in the normal assets. And so let's just copy this component and paste it here. So we have our circle and then let's just make it blue. And we can see it here and let's then add a collider to it, a circle collider. And let's also make a script. So I'm going to lock this in the inspector and make a new script. I'm going to call this script tail. Wow. I'm really great with the names today. So then in the prefab, let's add that tail script as a component and we can right click and edit the script. And so I'm just going to remove some of the stuff here. Start fresh. This is not a networked object. This is just following the movement of the player. So the way it works is that each tail will follow the previous tail because in slither.io, the tails follow each other with a slight delay. So we're going to be keeping track of a transform, public transform, follow transform. So this is the transform we will be following. Then we need to add a delay. I'm going to make this a serialized field, private float delay time. I'm just going to set this to 0.01f. So this is the amount of delay between each tail. And then let's add another one, private float distance. And let's set this to 0.3. And this is the distance between each of the tails. We're also going to here, let's set this to public transform networked owner. 
because we want the tail to keep track of who's its owner, like the head. And this is kind of like a linked list in a way, if you think about it, because each tail follows the other tail. And we're also going to make a private vector three target position. So this is where the tails are moving towards. And we're just declaring it now to avoid having to do it later. So now let's make a private update function here, which runs on every frame. And so now we're going to do some fancy maths. So target position is where we want to go to. Now, remember, this is each of the tails. We want to go towards our follow object. So follow transform dot position minus the follow transform dot forward times the distance. What the heck is this? This is one tail. This is our other tail. This is the follow transform. The follow transform position is this one. And then the transform forward is this one. So essentially, we're saying here the current position minus the forward. So a negative forward is backwards, right? Because we want the next tail to go behind the previous one. And then we're timesing it by the distance, which will scale this vector by 0 0.3. And we're not done yet. Hold on to your horses, folks. It gets better. Now we want to add the delay to the tail. So to add the delay, let's add on to that target position plus equals. We're going to put these parentheses and we're going to put times delay time. So what's inside the parentheses? Can you figure it out? Well, we have the current transform dot position of this tail. We have to take into account the current transform position. And then we're actually going to subtract the target position before adding it back to the target position. But OK, so we have the two tails. We had a vector here. This is our current transform position. So by subtracting the transform position from the target position, we can take into account the current position that it's at. And so we want to move from here to here. And so essentially, we're just subtracting the target position from the current transfer position, and then we're adding a little delay, and then we're adding it back to the target position so that it can move smoothly to that position with a time delay. You got it? <laughs> and then let's set the target position dot Z to zero because we're only moving on the X and Y, and we don't want any funky business to arise. So now we have to move the object. We can do transform dot position equals vector three dot lerp vector three lerp so linearly interpolate from the current position to the target position and we can do time dot delta time for the step times some value i'm just going to put this value up here serialize field private float move step and i'm just gonna put 10 as a value and then down here we can put move step and so this is great all right and that's essentially it for our script here. So now this is attached to our tail. Now we're going to go back to the player length script. We're going to get a reference to the tail dot try get component. So we're going to try to get the out tail tail. I know it's a mouthful. And let's wrap this in an if statement. So essentially, we're trying to get the component and it'll output a tail, which let's actually rename this to tail game object so it doesn't interfere. And I'm just going to replace these. And if it does find a component of type tail, it will output the variable tail. And with that, we can do tail dot networked owner and we can assign the networked owner to this current transform. We can assign the tail follow transform to currently there's only a head, but we need to keep track of the last tail so that the last tail can be set to the follow transform of the next tail. So just scroll up and let's add in a private transform last tail and if we scroll down on a network spawn let's set the last tail to the current transform which is the head and then the tail follow transform will be the last tail and then we set the last tail to the current tail game object dot transform and finally we're gonna be ignoring the collision physics 2d dot ignore collision ignore collision between this collider and the other balls because we're going to be doing on collision checks and we don't want the collisions of the same player to impact each other. So we can do ignore collision between the tail game object dot get component collider 2D parentheses are added wrong here and the current collider 2D, which we can just keep a reference to that up here. Private collider 2D underscore collider 2D and then on network spawn, we can get a 
reference to that. So get component collider 2D, 2D, and then we scroll down and then we just pass that there, collider 2D. And one thing you'll notice is that when you actually spawn the player, the sprite render will have difficulty sorting the different sprites because they're going to be overlapping. So we'll just do that preemptively and do tailgame object dot get component to a sprite render. And maybe you should do try get component, but for simplicity, I'll just do get component. Then let's set the sorting order. And so since we want the first tails to appear in front of the last tails, we can do length dot value. So the length is a network variable. However, you need to do dot value to get the actual value stored in it. And this is the U short or the U went 16. And we're going to do negative length dot value so that the longer it is, the sprites on the back appear under the sprites at the beginning. OK, so that's this function all dandy. Now we actually need to call this somewhere. So let's do a private void add length. Now we only want the length to be added by the server. This will only be added be added by the server, by the server or called by the server. Essentially here, we're going to set the length value plus equal to one. And then we're going to instantiate a tail, instantiate tail, which I totally botched the spelling here. So this will be called by the server because we don't want the clients to be able to change their own length, right? And so for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to add this as a context menu, add length. So we can call this directly from the inspector just to test this. All right, so if we go back to the editor under assets prefabs player. Let's drag in the tail into the tail prefab. I'm also going to make the player a little smaller. I think it's a tad too big. So I'm going to set the scale to 0.7 on all ends. And I'm going to start this, start the host, and I'm going to start the client. Client. Whee! Now, let's see what happens on the host when we right click on the player length script and click add length. So you see that now the ball is following around the player. It's great. However, if you look on the other end, there is no ball. And that's because the ball was only instantiated on the server side. We go here. We right click and we add a length here, right click, add length. You'll see that the client is not allowed to write to this network variable because we made it server authoritative. So we're going to have to have the server call this function and we have to actually spawn this instance on the other clients. We're also getting an error here. Value cannot be null. And that's because we don't actually have a collider attached to our main player prefab. So just add a collider 2D component, circle collider 2D to our player prefab. And that will work. And for the tail, let's uniformly scale it down to 0.7 so that it matches the head. So there's a few issues. So with the issues that I stated, let's deal with having the tails spawn on the other clients. How do we do that? Well, basically, once the length changes, we want the other clients to be able to call this function on their end. Luckily, network variable has a callback that we can subscribe to called on value changed. We can do length equals on value changed plus equals let's make a function called length changed and we only want to call this if we're not the server if we are not the server is server then we want to call this because the server is already calling this function it doesn't need to call the function again these are for all of the clients so that they can get notified that the length changed and updated on their end remember this script is running on all of the clients so let's scroll down and make a private void length changed. And the best way to debug these sort of issues, if you're having issues with synchronization, I just put debug.logs everywhere. And the debug.logs get printed on the editor console that it corresponds to. So it's an easy way to see what's getting printed out on a server versus what's getting printed out on the client. So I like to put debug.log. And of course, in an actual build, you want to like remove the debug.logs or filter them out. And I like to put here the name of the function and then some comment. So now we can do instantiate tail. And later on, we're going to add some UI and an audio clip. So we're going to do some other processing here, but only if it's the owner, because we only want to play an audio clip if the player has eaten a food. You don't want to hear other players audio for no reason, right? And you see that the length changed here. We have to pass in the previous and the new value. So let's just pass that in here. So use short previous value, if, even if we don't use it, and then use short new value. All right, now when we click play here, what we should see is that we have our host, we'll have our client, and now the client will be able to see a tail on the host's body. So let's click our host player, 
let's right click on player length add length you see i have the tail following it around go to the client a little hard to see we're gonna have to change around the windows here but you see that when the host moves around now you can see the tail being updated on both the client and the server in this case the server is the host which is also a client Whee! and so it might be useful if you only have one monitor to put these side by side i have three monitors so i've literally been working with all my monitors doing this it's helpful to have multiple monitors all right so now you learned how to use network variables now we actually have to make this work for clients so how are we going to do that well we need food we need to make food so let's make a food prefab so let's right click on our hierarchy let's create a 2d sprite and let's make it uh isometric diamond that's weird seems the 2023 version has a triangle but not the 2021.3 oh well we'll go with this weird triangle thing so i'm gonna make it red and let's make a new script and and then let's add a collider to it i'm gonna add a polygon collider 2d this is a networked object so we do need that network object script attached to it then we have to go into the network manager and sorry this is kind of squished here guys i'm gonna try to make this as best as i can and so now we have to add in a new network prefab here and let's lock it here and then in the assets under prefabs let's drag in our isometric diamond let's press f2 and rename that to food and then let's drag in the food there now we need to add a script to the food and i'm going to unlock the inspector here under the food i'm going to check is trigger because we want this to be a trigger collider once the player crashes into it now let's add a new script and let's call this food all right yummy food let's erase this things we don't need we're gonna make this a network behavior and put using unity.net code up here and we are going to do private void on trigger enter 2d and so first we want to check if this is a player so if cole dot compare tag player so if it's not a player then let's just return because we only want this to be eaten by a player and we're also going to need to add a rigid body 2d to this which i'll add in soon so that the trigger is triggered now we only want this to be run by the server because we want the server to be in charge of this make sure the clients aren't cheating so if network manager dot singleton dot is server so it's if it's not the server then we return we don't want this to be run now we can get the component out of the player so if cole dot try component of type player length player length if we can get that component then let's call player length dot add length add length which is currently private and we'll need to put that public so once you put that public in the player length script go back to the food and we can do add length so this will only be called by the server it is a possibility that the tails collide with the food so if you also want to implement that the tails can collect the food then you can do col dot try component out tail tail so we're getting the tail then you can do tail dot networked owner we can access the network owner of this tail we can do dot get component player length and you might want to put this in a try get component get component length and then add the length from there so essentially here all we're doing is just calling that function so that the length network variable increases by one and a ball is instantiated then we want to despawn this object we can do network object so this network object does not refer to a type this refers to this network object which is quite interesting so we can do network object dot despawn so it despawns it from the scene it removes it from the network scene and we'll also be implementing a networked object pool which will be fun so look forward to that so that will call this function at length which will instantiate the tails locally and since the length value has changed on the server then the clients have subscribed to this on value changed function and so that will then call length changed which will instantiate the tails on each client's instance okay so if we click play we got our host we got our client and there's an error the configuration between the server and the client is not matched first i'm going to remove this isometric diamond and i want to show you these errors because you might get these errors we have the host we have the client and there's an error well technically it's a warning but it's not working so it's an error for us now i'm noticing that in our instance of the network manager we have the food prefab 
However, in the cloned instance, there is no food prefab in the network prefabs list for some reason. So maybe the editor instance hasn't been updated. So I'm going to close out of that and let's reopen that clone manager. However, I'm also going to just put a food in the scene that it's zero zero and they just set it somewhere around here. Let's open up the clone. All right, so let's spawn this host here. Let's spawn our client. There seems to be some lag delay here. But you'll see that we don't get that warning anymore. So it's just that the parallel sync instance wasn't updated. All right, so before pressing play, let's also add a rigid body 2D to our food. Let's decrease the mass and also set the gravity to zero so it doesn't just go flying off. And let's also freeze the position and rotation here. Or you can just freeze it from the start. All right, so if we press play, that warning disappears, which means it's just a parallel sync issue. All right, and in the food, apart from the rigid body 2D, also make sure to add in that food script, yummy food. All right, and then make sure to add the player tag to the player. So click the player prefab, then select player under the tag. And then finally, there's a small bug that I noticed with the movement, and it's because of the mouse world coordinates. We have to set the mouse world coordinates Z to zero because this calculation might be setting the Z value to a different value, and then that's causing the player to move at different speeds, or it seems to move at different speeds, but in reality, it's moving in the wrong dimension. So now that you've assigned all these values, let's start the game. Let's make a host here, and now let's make a client. So movement is smooth, all's well in the world. And now if the host eats this little ball, you'll see that now it increases to two balls, or tails and the movement is synchronized on both clients. So let's restart this and let's try it on the client side instead of the host. So let's have the host be here. Let's have the client join in. Let's have the client eat the food. Now you see the food is despawned and you'll see that the tail is replicated on both ends. If you look at the console, it says length changed callback. So we know that the length was changed on the server and the callback was triggered on the client and the client updated the tails accordingly. Awesome. What's up next? Now let's spawn the food over the map randomly and also use an object pool. After that, we're going to add some audio noises so that the client can hear audio when the food is ate or eaten along with updating the UI. And then we'll start to implement the player collision and the game over along with changing to server authoritative movement and also limiting the amount of players that can join the game. So let's start with that food spawner. So let's go into our scripts folder and let's create a new C sharp script and we're gonna call that food spawner. Now, if you're not sure what an object pool is, I do have a full video covering an object pool and how to make one on your own. It's not a networked object pool, which we'll be implementing here, but it does go over the basics of what it is. And essentially it is a container of objects. Also, I'm not sure how long that dot has been there. <laughs> so let's say we have our food here. Instead of having to instantiate it and destroy it constantly, which takes computational power and resources, we instantiate it at the beginning on start. I'm trying my best here. So the food here, then we place it in a pool and we deactivate the game objects. So you put the food in a pool or a container. And then when you need a food object, then you fetch it from the container, which I'm still getting used to this drawing thing, so excuse me. <laughs> you fetch it from this container and activate the game object. And when you're done, you just return it to the pool. And it's an easy way to save on performance if you are spawning a lot of objects. So let's implement that networked object pool, which is going to be pretty simple. And there is still two important things that I have not covered, RPCs. So stay tuned. So for the networked object pool, you can just go to this Unity documentation link and they have an implementation that we can just copy right here network object pool i'll put it in the description and so we'll also make a new script here and we'll call this a network object pool if you double click that you can just copy in that script and it will work fine and dandy now we go back into the unity editor we can right click and create a new game object called pool manager and let's add the networked object pool component and just click yes here since this is a networked object, we do need that network object component. Let's clear this. And so here with the pooled prefabs list, you can add multiple prefabs that you want to be pooled. So I'm just going to stretch this out. There is a little bug here. So there's a little visual bug, but no worries here. So I'm going to lock the inspector, go to my prefabs, then I'm going to drag and drop the food into the prefab container here. Pre-warm count is how many do you want to instantiate at the beginning? So let's say we want 50 to start off. 
And this is going to make it easier for us to test so that we have a lot of food spawned on the map and then we can easily tell what's going on. And we're also going to add that food spawner component on here and let's just edit that script. So we do need a reference to our prefab. So serialize field private game object prefab. This is important. The way the network object pool works is that it identifies the prefab and withdraws from that pool given a prefab. And this is a singleton, so we'll be able to access this without a direct reference. So essentially, when the server starts, we want to spawn the food. So in our start function here, I'm going to put private. Let's do network manager, and then we can do singleton. And there's a few events here. So we can do on server started, on client connected, and on client disconnected. So in this case, we're going to do on server started, and we're going to make a function called spawn food start. And so let's remove this update function and we can do private void spawn food start. And up here, we can erase these two using statements and put using unity.netcode. So once this is called, we can actually unsubscribe from that event. We can do network manager dot singleton dot on server started minus equals spawn food start, just so we don't have that event running and wasting resources. And now we can get a reference to the network object pool dot singleton and we have to initialize the pool initialize pool so this will initialize the pool so this essentially calls this function which creates an instance of the prefabs given your pre-warm count and then sends it to the pool so we initialize the pool and then we can do a for loop so for int i equals zero i is less than and we can just do some arbitrary value plus plus i just chose 30 then let's spawn food not the start just spawn food which let's make a new function and we can call this private void spawn food and so this will actually get from the pool so we can do network object object network object pool dot singleton dot get network object and to get an object we have to pass in the prefab then we can pass in the position and rotation that we want it to spawn at so that's neat that it comes with that built in so we're going to make a function called get random position on map. And then let's just do quaternion.identity for the rotation. And so we're going to make this function soon. But before that, let's spawn that object. So object.spawn and let's pass in true. So destroy with scene, which means that when the scene is changed, the object should be destroyed, which is true. Now to return it to the pool, we actually don't want to despawn it. We just want to return it to the pool. The food will need a reference to the prefab because to return to the pool, you also need to specify the prefab. So let's do public game object prefab here in the food spawner. Let's do object dot get component food dot prefab equals prefab. So set the prefab. So then the food we can go here. We can do network object pool dot singleton dot return network object. We pass in the network object, which is literally just network object here and then prefab we can comment this out and then for the get random position on map let's make a private vector three get random position on map on map and so let's return a new vector three let's do a random dot range and so i already got these values but let's do negative 17 to 17 on the x random dot range negative nine to nine on the y and then on the Z, let's just do zero. So this is just the length of the screen in meters in Unity. And then we actually want to be able to spawn food over time. So after we do the for loop, let's make a curatine. We're going to call a curatine, start curatine, spawn over time, spawn over time. And we're going to make this function. And a curatine essentially is a function that you can stop or pause execution of given some condition. So if we go down here, we do IE numerator and you do need this using system dot collections. We can do spawn over time. We can make that private as well. And we can do a while loop here. So while the network manager dot singleton dot connected clients dot count is greater than zero. So while there's more than one client connected, then we're going to wait for a few seconds. So yield return new wait for seconds, wait for seconds let's do like let's do two seconds and then we can spawn the food and so if we actually want to check if there's enough food spawned we can do an if statement 
and get the current prefab count. However, that function is not included directly in the network objects pool, so we'll just make it. Also, in the food spawner, the Unity boss room infrastructure namespace was automatically added for me because the network objects pool has this namespace. However, you can add that namespace to use the network objects pool or you can actually just remove this namespace, scroll to the bottom and remove that semicolon and then just select everything and shift tab so that it shifts over one value. And then in the food spawner class, I'm going to remove this namespace. It's a little confusing because it keeps adding namespaces for me automatically. All right, so in the network objects pool, let's make that function. So let's do a public int get current prefab count. And let's take in the type of the prefab if we scroll up, you'll see that we do have some structures here. This pooled objects contains the list of objects in the pool, but we actually want to know how many objects are spawned at the moment. So we'll just copy this and create a new dictionary. And so instead of dictionary and Q, we'll actually do a dictionary and an int, and we'll call this non pooled objects. So this will essentially keep track of the objects outside of the pool. So let's replace this with int. And so we need to populate this dictionary whenever a prefab has been removed from the pool. So right here, when we dequeue or we create an instance, if there's not enough in the pool, we can just call non pooled objects. We can pass in the prefab and then we increment this value. So we do plus plus. So now we're basically saying there's an object outside of this pool. And when an object is returned to the pool, we have to go to the return function right here under return network object. Once we enqueue it into the pool, now we can call non pooled objects, pass in our prefab, but instead do minus minus, which decrements the count. And so here in our function get current prefab count, we can now just return the non pooled objects with the index being our prefab. And that'll return the count of how many are currently outside of the pool and spawned. And finally, we have to actually initialize the value to zero before we can increment or decrement it. And we can do that in the initialize pool function in the for each loop before the prefab is registered. We can just call non pooled objects and pass in the index of the config object prefab. And we can set that to zero. And so the way this register prefab internal works is that it actually calls return network object here. And so you see here we're incrementing our pooled objects, even though technically none of the prefabs are being spawned. And so essentially we're just going to want to copy this and paste it again, but after the prefab has been registered internally. So essentially this is just setting the value to zero, the initial value. So there's no null references. And this one is just setting it back to zero. So we start with the correct count when the prefabs are spawned. And in the food spawner, we also have to add here before we actually spawn the object, we'll have to add an if statement. So if object dot is not spawned, so is spawned, but negated. So if it's not spawned, then we spawn it because there can be a chance that it's already been spawned on the network. And so this will set the position and the rotation for us and put it on the map. However, if it's spawned and you don't have this if statement here, it might throw an error saying that this object has already been spawned. Then down here, before we spawn the food, we can check if network object pool dot singleton dot get current prefab count is less than max prefab count, which we'll declare, then we can spawn the food. So max prefab count, let's go up here, let's make it a private const max prefab count, and let's set it to 50, and let's make this an integer. All right, following along, that was aggressive. <laughs> we need energy, energy for networking. And so that's essentially it for the food spawner. We start the curatine, which will spawn over time. And there is a little error here. Let's see. Forgot to add the parentheses here and pass in the prefab. And then the food here will return the networked object to the pool. All right, let's try this out. All right, so we can actually remove this food from the scene now and we can click play and then click host. So clicking host, there's an error, let's see. It's because the food spawner does not have a reference to the prefab, aha, uh -huh. debugging. So let's drag in the food into the food spawner, then click host. You'll see that food will begin to spawn. Let's change from free aspect to 16 by nine. And it seems that my calculations were a little off. They're spawning off the screen. 
but that's okay. Um, you get the point. So when we collect the food, you'll see that it returns to the pool. You see that here are all the foods that were spawned. And if we collect one, you'll see that they're being returned to the pool and others are being spawned. So that was pretty easy. And let's just make sure this works on the client as well. So let's start up that client instance just to make sure everything's dandy. So let's click the client here. Let's change from free aspect to 16 by 9. And there's definitely something wrong here. So let's try collecting the food. So the food isn't actually removing itself from the view. However, if we do collect the other food, it works. But the food is actually not being disappeared from the client. So to fix that, we can go into our food here and we can just comment out this despawn, which for some reason I thought the despawn was called in the network object pool, but it's not. So we can just uncomment that out and despawn that network object once it's eaten. And so that will fix the issues. Usually I cut off errors from my videos. However, because networking is so strange and I came across with a lot of issues myself, I thought it'd be useful to show you errors that you may have so that you can also get debugging skills when they arise. Okay, so that works. If you wanted to change the size of the screen because some of the food is spawning out, you can just count here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's around 9 in length, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in height. So you can just go back to the food spawner and instead of negative 17, we can just go from negative 9 to 9 and from negative 5 to 5 to make sure that spawns within this little camera range. All right, now let's update our client UI with the current length of the client and also add a sound effect. So for the UI, let's just make a little canvas on the hierarchy. So let's right click on the hierarchy and make a canvas, the so UI canvas. We can call this the player canvas, player canvas, and we can unlock the inspector here. Then change the UI scale mode to scale with screen size 1920 by 1080. Now let's right click and add a UI text mesh pro text. Let's call this length. Then let's click this rect transform alt and shift bottom left so that the text is positioned accordingly. All right. And then just move it a little bit so it's not cutting cut off. And then I'm going to scale it so it's a little bigger and decrease the width. I'm going to press F2 and call that length. And I'm going to control D and call this the count. I'm going to drag that over here and I'm going to set this to one, which is the default. And there's way too big. Let's decrease the size here, actually, and just move that accordingly. So essentially, we want to change this text to the current player's length. So let's do that. So in our player length, when we change the length under the length changed event, we can check if we are the owner. So if we're not the owner, return. Then Let's actually shoot out an event so that the UI can subscribe to it and update itself. So let's scroll up and let's make that event. And for sake of simplicity, let's just make it static. So public static event system dot action. There's multiple ways to do events. We're going to send out a U short, which is our length, this type of U short here. And let's call this the changed length event. You see, Writer just keeps adding stuff here. I don't even know what this is. Ah, so this basically requires that this has to be checked for null before you can use it because it can be null. Okay, so if we scroll down and now we can do changed length event dot invoke. And so we have to check if it's null before using it. Essentially, it's null if no one has subscribed to the event. So to do that, we can just add a question mark here, which is like, is this null? If it's not, then we can continue on with the function. These are nullables and whatnot. So we can invoke and we can pass in our length dot value. OK, and now let's make a script that attaches to the UI. So go to your scripts and let's create a new script and let's call it UI player stats You can double click that. I'm going to remove this stuff that we do not need. We do not need this. We are going to need using TM Pro. And we need a reference to the text that we want to change. So serialize field. Oh boy, we can do private text mesh pro you GUI and let's just call this length text. So we have private text mesh pro you GUI length text. And now let's subscribe to that event. So let's do an on enable function. So we can do player length since it's a static class event. We can do change length event plus equals change length text, which is the function we'll create. Then let's unsubscribe to it. So events basically kind of shoot out and classes are 
responsible for subscribing to them and listening to them if they want to get that notification. So you have to make sure to unsubscribe to it because if it remains open, you can have resources leak out. So we got private void change length text, and then it takes in a U short length. Then we can do length text dot text. So this changes the text and then length dot to string because a U short is not a string and we have to convert it to a string. All right, so we have this script done. It's great. So we can go back into the editor then we can go into the player canvas and we can add in the UI player stats component and we can drag in that count here to the length text. And so now this should be updated per client. We can just quickly test that out. So if we got the host, it's not updating because actually the host is technically the server. If you remember, the server calls this add length function and this is called by the clients. And so we can actually add an extra check here and essentially do the same thing. So if it's not the owner return and invoke this event. And this is essentially only because this can be a host. If you have a server that's not a host, then we won't have to do this because the server doesn't need to know about their own UI because they don't have a player. All right. And so you'll see we have some duplicate code here, like exactly the same code. So we can abstract this into a new function that's called private void length changed. And you're going to be like, this is the same function, but we're going to actually changed this function to event and this function is just going to have this code here while the length changed event function will call the length changed function and up here we're going to replace length changed with length changed event and then this add length function which is called by the server we're just gonna call our length changed function so we're just making the code look nice right i want to teach good coding practices a lot of tutorials are made for simplicity and just showing how you use a feature. And sometimes the coding practices may not be the best. Anyways, I'm rambling. Look at the length. It's updating. Awesome. So let's reload the client and check it here. So the client, now you'll see that the length is updating and each client has their own UI. Awesome. And so essentially we can do the same thing for audio. In the case of the audio, we can subscribe to the event or we can make it a singleton. So let's call this client music player. So I do have a video on singletons and I know it's a hotly debated topic. So use them sparingly. As you see, a lot of networked things are singletons. Unity has a singleton that we can use that's also networked. Now I have absolutely no idea what link I pulled it off of because I'm not finding it, but I'll leave it in the description as a GitHub gist. So you can just click it, copy it and paste it in your project. And so it's really cool. We're going to make a new script here, call it singleton. And so we click that and we paste it and you'll see there's multiple implementations. We have a normal singleton. We have a singleton persistent, which persists across multiple scenes and a networked singleton and then a singleton network persistent. So there's quite a lot of options here, depending on your use case. And essentially a singleton lets you access a class from anywhere because it's a static instance. And so we can use it like this singleton and client music player. You can make this singleton persistent or you can make this a singleton network, for example. But for now, we can just make this a singleton. And so we'll get a reference to our audio source, audio source underscore audio source. Since this script will be attached to the audio source and on awake, let's get a reference to the audio source. And so we can do public override void awake. And we do override because singleton has an awake function and we have to override it. So let's make sure to call the base awake and then we can get our audio source dot get component audio source and we can do public void play nom audio clip which nom is just like the sound i make like nom 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 <laughs> and so here let's get a reference to our audio clip serialize field private audio clip we're going to call this nom audio clip and here we can place the audio source audio source dot clip equals nom audio clip and we can do audio source dot play alrighty and so we can remove the using statements that aren't being used and additionally as an extra you can require a component on this class type of audio source so this makes sure that there's an audio source attached to this game object so that there's not a null reference here 
All right, and let's make a new folder here and call this audio. And so you're free to use any sounds. In my case, I used this horror zombie biting on bones, which oddly sounds like it's biting on an apple. So I'll just use that one. And then I'll just drag that into the audio. And it's also CCO, so public domain. Nice. Thank you, Brevisips. Anyways, so now let's make a new empty here and let's call this the audio manager. Let's add in our client music player. You see it adds that audio source in for us because of the require component. And let's drag in that audio clip into that field and let's not click or uncheck the play on awake so it doesn't play immediately. And let's also drag the audio clip into our script or I'm just going to click this circle here. And so I made the script so that it's easier for you to extend on it. So now let's call this from our player length right here in the length changed function. We can call client music player dot singleton dot instance dot play nom audio clip. And so now we'll be able to hear the nom sound and make sure the mute audio here isn't clicked or if it's too annoying, you can click it. There is an error and I made a small mistake here. I accidentally put a dot get component, but it's equals get component. And I actually like to put my serialized fields at the top before the private variables. Go back to the Unity editor. Let's test this out. So let's click host and then you'll see the little num sounds pop up. Nice. And it will only play on the client that eats the food. And so if it gets too annoying, you can just mute the audio here in the game tab, mute audio while you're testing. All right. So next up, we're going to implement collision with both the players and we'll be looking into RPCs or remote procedure calls, which are super important. And it's a way to communicate between server and client or the host. And after that, we'll change the movement to server authoritative. And we'll also explore connection approval so that you can limit the amount of players that are in the match. Or you can even do some other processing in this section, such as changing pay player prefabs depending on certain conditions. All right. Are you pumped? Because I'm pumped because we're going to get into some juicy stuff. We're going to be exploring RPCs remote procedure calls. And so essentially what we're going to want to do is when the clients crash into each other, we want the server to decide who is the winner, AKA who will die and who will live. And then the server will be able to tell the clients, Hey, you died or Hey, you're the winner. And we want to do this on the server so it can be more server authoritative. All right. So here's a nice little diagram for you. So let's say we have our client, which calls on collision enter on the local client instance. And instead of checking who's the winner on the client, we want the server to check it because we want the server to be in charge of determining this important thing. We don't want the client to be cheating. So how do we execute code on the server from the client? Well, we use something called a server RPC, which RPC stands for remote procedure call. And so a server RPC means that this code is called from the client, but it runs on the server. And so once the server has then determined who is the winner, who's the loser, then it sends out a client RPC to the clients. A client RPC is called by the server, but runs on the client. So I like to think of it as whatever's in front of RPC, that's where it's getting run on. And the opposite, which is a server in this case, is what's calling the RPC. So these are very important concepts in order to communicate between different scripts running on different instances, on different clients and on different servers. And so by default, the client RPC runs on all the clients if the server calls the client RPC function. But what if we only want to notify a specific client? So let's say client one wants to send a message to client two through the server. Well, luckily Unity has client RPC params that we can input into the client RPC that allow us to specify the target client's ID. So we can select multiple clients that we want to be able to receive some information from the server. So let's implement that functionality. So go into your scripts folder and then we're going to click the player controller. And so with the player controller, we want to do an on collision check. So we can scroll all the way down and let's do a private void on collision enter 2D, which takes a type of collision 2D. So when this player collides with something, then we'll do some functionality. So here, when the player collides with another player, then we want to implement collision. So I'm just going to put a debug.log here so we can make sure that this is being called. And I like this to be called player collision. 
And of course, you can remove this after we're done testing. And now we want to check if we collided with a player. So if col.gameobjects.compare tag, we want to compare the tag to player. So if the tag on this object is player, and generally I like to actually negate it and return it early. And this is good coding practice. You don't have nested if statements. We also want to check if we are the owner of this script of this player. So if we're not the owner, then we can just return. And so now there's actually multiple ways we can collide with the player. We can actually either collide with the head or we can collide with a tail. We'll also have to make sure to put the tail as a player tag so that works properly. So let's just do that now so we don't forget or well, I don't forget. <laughs> so go into prefabs and select the tail and put the tag as player as well. Make sure the player has the player tag. All right. Now, if we have a head on collision, so head on collision, let's check for that. So if the collider dot game object dot try get component. So how do we know if it's the head? Well, it should have either a player controller or a player length attached to it. So let's get the player length in this case. So out player length, player length. And with this, we can get the length of the other game object. And so when the two collide, we want to check who has the bigger size. And then we're going to pass that information to the server. So let's make a function that we're going to call determine collision winner server RPC. And so this is going to be our first server RPC. Whoa. So you have to put this brackets and then put server RPC on top of the function so it can be marked as a server RPC. And then we can do private void determine collision winner server RPC. Your function must end with server RPC with that capitalization or else it will not work. So those are the two requirements, putting server RPC on top of the function and then the function name must end in server RPC. And I spelled determine wrong here. So now we basically want to pass information to the server. There's multiple ways we can do it. We can just do it directly. There are some restrictions on what data you can pass to server and client RPCs, which you can find in the documentation, which I will link below. Essentially, it has support for Unity primitives out of the box and whatever you're sending has to be serializable. So you can see it supports C sharp primitives like integer string. It supports Unity primitives like color. It supports enums as well because those have built in serialization. It supports arrays of primitive types such as int array. And then if you need anything, but if you need other parameters not covered by these, you'll have to make a custom network serializable class and pass in your data that you want to be serialized and serialize it manually, which I'll show you in a moment. So we can send our data manually. However, to show you how it's done, let's make a custom iNetwork serializable. And so if you don't know what serializing means, it's essentially the process of transforming uh, data structures or objects into a format that Unity can later store and reconstruct. So when you're playing a game, for example, and you have save data, well, that data needs to be saved onto the machine. So usually you have to serialize it so the machine can be able to store that. And then when the game loads up, you can deserialize the data so that you can use it back in your game as an example. So we can do struct, let's do player data, player data, and we'll extend from iNetwork serializable. So now we can put in what data we want to be serialized. So we need a public ulong ID. So this is our client ID. And then we'll need a public u short length, which is the length of the player. And so you'll see there is an error here. It's because we haven't implemented the mandatory function. So if you click it and then hover over, press control dot, you can click implement missing members or you can write it manually. And so this is network serializer takes in a buffer serializer serializer where T, which is a generic parameter, is an I reader writer, which is an interface. So all we have to do here is called serializer dot serialize value. And then we pass in what we want to serialize. But we can't just pass in the value directly. We have to pass in a reference to the value so we can put ref in front of the value. And then we can copy that, which I did with shift and alt and pressing down. And then instead of ID, let's put length. And so my naming conventions are a little off here. As you can see, writers complaining, suggested name is length. So I'm just going to change it so we can make writer happy, which is the IDE I'm using. All right. And so up here, 
we can now make a player data object. We can do var player one, new player data, and put curly braces after. And then we can assign the ID from here. So this will be our current player. So RD is our owner client ID. And then our length is going to be our get component player length dot length dot value. And I forgot to put these capital letter. So since we might call this multiple times, let's just cache this value so we don't have to keep getting the component each time. So we're going to call this component player length, and then we can scroll up and declare a private player length and call it player length. And then in the initialize function, we can do player length equals to that get component player length. All right, so we have our first player. We can just copy that and call this player two. Our player two, however, for the length, we'll be using this player length that we got the component out of. And then for the client ID, we can do player length dot owner client ID. And with this, we can now pass in these parameters into determine our winner server RPC. So we can pass in the player one and the player two. And then in the server RPC, we can pass in the player data for player one and the player data for player two. Now I want to note something very important. This can only be called by the owner of this network object by default. So if you see, we can put parentheses here and there's something called require ownership. By default, this is true. So only the owner of this network object can call this server RPC. If for some reason you want any client to be able to call this server RPC, even if they're not the owner, then you can set this to false. So for example, if you look at the documentation, there is an example here. You might want any client to have invocation rights. So it can be a global server RPC that any client can access. And then if for some reason you want to know which client invoked this server RPC, you can just pass in these parameters, which are the default parameters, but you need to pass these in server RPC params to be able to access information regarding the sender. And then you can access the client ID by doing server RPC params dot receive dot sender client ID. You can check in the network manager, the connected clients. So this keeps track of all the clients. If it contains the client ID, then we can get a reference to our connected client, which this is a networked object. And this is the recommended way to find out who sent a server RPC. As you can see, this is the best practice. Unity does not recommend sending the client ID directly because it can produce potential security issues if the client sends their own IDs. And so you can see other examples in the documentation. Now this code isn't entirely foolproof because a lot of it is kind of client side. Because if you think about it, this function is running on the client and we're constructing this data on the client. There are ways to make everything run on the server. However, it does incur some overhead and some more planning ahead with your code. But for this case, we'll just do this method where we determine the winner on the server and then relay the information back to the clients. So be sure to just take into consideration all of these trade-offs and what's needed in your case. All right, so we have this determine winner. And so here we can check if player one dot length is greater than player two dot length, then we do something else. We do something else. So we're going to make actually another function and we're going to call that private void win information server RPC. And here we're going to take in the winner, which is a U long winner. And then we're going to take in a U long loser. And then let's add that server RPC tag server RPC, because we also are going to call this in this function. So here we can call win information server RPC. You can pass in our winner, which is player one dot ID. And then our loser, which is player two dot ID. And we can just copy this, paste it here. And instead of player one, we put player two. And instead of player two, we put player one. And so now in this function, we want to tell the clients who's the winner and who's the loser. So now we need a client RPC. So we need two functions. We need one for the client that wins and one for the client that loses. So we can do private void eight player. And this is a client RPC, so we'll put client RPC, same rules as a server RPC. And on top of this, we'll put client RPC. So this will be sent to the client that ate the player. And so how do we ensure that this is sent to the right client? 
Well, we can use these client RPC params. Client RPC params. Client RPC params equals default. And when we call this function, we'll make our own client RPC params and pass in our target player. So then here we can do debug.log and put you ate a player. We can also ensure that only the owner of this script can execute the rest of this function by checking if it's the owner. Okay, cool. Now let's do one for the game over. So let's make another client RPC. We can do private void game over client RPC. And again, we can take in the client RPC params that that's a default. All right, check if we are the owner. If it's not the owner, then we return. Now this is called if we lose. So we can do a debug.log and we can put you lose. You lose. We can shut down this client. So to shut down the client, we can do network manager.singleton.shutdown. There's also a Boolean for a shutdown in progress, which returns true if the network manager is currently being shut down. We can call shutdown. And so when the game is over, we essentially also want to change something on the screen. We want to have a UI pop up that says game over. So let's create an event. If we scroll all the way to the top, that will shoot out and we'll put an event here to make a public static event system.action. It's in the system namespace, or you can import the system namespace. We're going to call this game over event. And we can add that can be null as well. We did previously. And we can scroll back down. And before shutting it down, we can say game over event. If someone's subscribed to it, then we'll invoke it or we'll call this event. All right. So in this win information server RPC, we can call the eight player client RPC and we want to pass in the winner. But for that, we need to make a new client RPC params. We can call that client RPC params and we can do new client RPC params, put it curly braces, and then we can pass in some parameters. So we can do send equals new client RPC send params. Instead of parentheses, we do curly braces and then we pass in the target client's IDs, which is a list, a read only list of ulongs, which are the IDs. Now we can make a new ulong array here and pass in our winner as so. However, Unity actually recommends making this array at the beginning and caching it with a certain size. So we don't have to be creating a new ulong constantly. So we can go up and we can declare a private read only because the array itself will not be changing. Ulong array. We can call this target clients array. We can initialize it, new Ulong. And we know that we'll only need to send one client at all times. So we can initialize it to one in this case. So if we scroll back down here, we can do target clients array. And then before we call this, we can set the target clients array at zero, which is the first index to our winner. And so then we can pass in the client RPC params into the eight client player RPC. All right. And so now we can just do the same and we can copy this and paste it down here. So instead of the winner, we're going to put loser and we can, instead of doing this all over again, we can just change the target client IDs. So we can do client RPC params dot send dot target client IDs equals, and we can equal it to the new one instead of making a new object here. And then instead of eight player, we can put game over client RPC. And so now this will be called on the client that loses, which is great, not for the client, but <laughs> and so now that we have this all dandy, we have the server RPCs, we have the client RPCs, we can scroll down and put another else if statement here. So what happens if it collides with not the player length, but with a tail. And so we can check that by doing component out this outputs a tail tail and so if it has a tail that means it's a tail obviously <laughs> so we can do a debug.log here and do tail collision and up here we can do a debug.log head collision head collision and so if the tail collides you can do this processing on the server however i'm just going to call this win information server rpc directly from here and pass in our winner, which if we collide with a tail, we automatically lose, right? So the winner would be the other game object. So we can do tail.networksowner 
which is a transform. We can get our component, get component player controller, and then we can pass in the owner client ID. And finally, our loser would be our current client. So pass in our own client ID. But that's pretty simple. And so these are the basics of server and client RPCs. Essentially, we can call server RPCs from clients to run code on the server. And then we can call client RPCs from servers to run code on clients or on specific clients, which you can pass with RPC params. And then for server RPCs, this can only be called by the owner of this networked object, which is a client. However, you can also put require ownership and set that to false so that any client can call this server RPC, even if it's not the owner. Alrighty, cool. So before we test this out, let's just make a game over canvas so we can see this well. Call this game over canvas in the hierarchy. Right click and create a canvas. Set the canvas scaler to scale with screen size 1920 by 1080. And let's right click and add a UI panel. Let's make this black. And let's right click and add a text. Let's just name the text game over text game over. And I'm going to scroll down and center it. And I'm going to click this scale lock and then make it bigger. And also set the anchor presets with shift alt to the center. And of course, we're going to disable the canvas on the game over canvas so that it doesn't show. However, we're going to make a script. We're going to call this UI game over. We're going to attach this script to our canvas, our game over canvas, add a UI game over. And then I'm just going to delete this code that we don't need, which is essentially most of it. And we get a reference to our canvas. So we can do private canvas and let's call this game over canvas on the start function. Let's get a reference game over canvas equals get component canvas I'll type canvas and we can do private void on enable and do player controller dot game over event plus equals game over which will define this function in a minute we can do private void on disable so we're just subscribing to the event and unsubscribing once we're done controller dot game over event minus equals game over all right and then let's make function private void game over we can do game over canvas dot enabled equals to true. So we're just setting the canvas to true with this simple script. I'm going to remove this using statement. All right, so now let's test this out. All right, so if we press play on both, I'm pressing alt tab to switch between the two. We have our host. I'm going to mute it just because it's loud. So we have our host who's length 10. Now we have our client who joins in and is also eating. I'm also going to mute this. It's noisy. All right, so. Let's look at the console for both. Now we have length six. Now let's see what happens when we crash into the other one, which is length 10. Nothing happens. And that's because I forgot that for on collision enter, we need a rigid body on one of the things that are colliding. So we can go to our player and add a rigid body 2D, rigid body 2D, cool beans. And we can actually set this to kinematic. So the physics won't actually interact with it. And we also have to go into the player and actually select use full kinematic contacts to allow collisions between kinematic and kinematic rigid bodies. Cool. So let's start the host here. Now you're going to see a little problem. We've got the host. Now we got the client. If they crash head on, the client loses. That makes sense. Now we have the host. We have the client. Let's say the client's bigger than the host. Client goes to eat the host. Since the host disconnects, the client also disconnects, which is not what we want. So that's the problem with hosts is that if the host dies, then the game's over because all the clients are disconnected because the host is a server, which is not good. So what we can do is actually make another instance and just have that be the server and have the clients connect to the server. Also, there seems to be an error because the tails aren't getting destroyed when the player is despawned. So we can fix that. In our player length, we can add a public override on network despawn. So when this object is despawned from the network, we can destroy our tails, destroy the tails. We can make a function here called private void destroy tails. And here, essentially, we can just loop through the tails until we've destroyed them all. So we can do a while loop. So while our list tails dot count does not equal zero. So while there's something in the list, let's get a reference to the tail game object tail equals tails at zero. Then we can remove it from the list. We can do tails 
dot remove at which removes at a specific index so we remove the first index and then we can destroy the tail that we have a reference to so now the tails will be destroyed also we can remove this context menu from the add length that we were using to debug previously so that should fix those weird transform errors and so now essentially let's do that and have a server and two clients connect so you're going to want to open up a new editor instance in the clones manager as i stated in the beginning and so let's actually make a new canvas here this is going to be called the server canvas and i'm actually going to copy the contents from these two canvases but instead of game over text i'm going to call this server text and this is going to say server so we can disable this canvas we can also set the scaler to 1920 by 1080 so it scales with screen size and essentially when we click this server button we're going to also add a new event here and we're going to pass in our server canvas and we're going to enable that canvas and click the check mark here so now we're working with three editors so let's click server so now with the server you'll see that no player is being spawned but the food is still being spawned because the server is still running the food script however it's not adding more foods because there's no connected clients remember we checked here in the pool manager essentially we checked while there are more than zero connected clients then we spawn the food however if there's no one connected there's no point in spawning food so now let's put this so we can see the clients press reload here so parallel sync changes take effect now i'm going to press play on both click the client the client connects you can see on the server you can see the client moving all right and then here we connect the other client and that's great on the new editor we can change from free aspect to 16 by 9 so we can see a little better so we have these two clients now this one is going to be length four and we're going to crash into the other guy and it's going to win you'll see the you ate a player and you lose and you can see head collision now there was a little bug i encountered which happens when a snake is too long so let's just collect a lot of food here since it takes time to go from the server and back if the player collides with multiple objects at a time so the head and the tail well in this case it didn't work but it could be that in the player controller script on collision enter is called multiple times and so it can be the case that since it's called multiple times at different instances that both players might be destroyed by accident so what i did is just add a little time delay i did a little coroutine here private ie numerator and i call this collision check coroutine and so for this you need to import system collections ie numerator so i'm just going to hover over it press control and dot and you'll see that it adds system.collections for me and here we can yield return new wait four seconds and let's wait for 0.5 of a second so half of a second and we're going to set a boolean can collide equals false and after that we can collide again can collide equals true so down here we check if we can't collide can collide then we'll return and we can start that coroutine start coroutine collision check coroutine and so now let's declare our can collide variable up here which is just a normal boolean private bool and then can collide and we can set that to true as the default value we can scroll down there's an error i forgot the semicolon that's important so that's just if you encounter that issue and that's because essentially the client code is running this on collision enter 2d if you have the server managing everything all the collisions everything's running on the server and the clients are just updating their position and whatnot that would be fully server authoritative but it's good to learn these different methods and so another interesting thing is that what happens if the players collide when it's the same size you see it just chose one at mostly random so you can implement further functionality to differentiate who gets chosen all right so that's all nice and dandy there's just a few more things to cover right now we're using client authoritative movement and so what happens if we want the movement to be on the server well for that on our player we'll actually have to get rid of this client network transform because that is only for client authoritative movement i'm just minimizing this and we're gonna have to add a network transform which they don't let you add because you have this already so we can just remove that and just add a network transform and deselect the things that we won't be using similar to the last one as so then in our player controller script where we do our movement is in the update function so we're going to move this from the update function we're going to make a new function that's going to be called 
private void move player client so this is just to show you how to move the player on both ends and i'm just going to copy this code erase it and put it on this move player client so this is for the client authoritative movement client authoritative movement now let's make one for the server so let's do private void move player server and let's call move player server here so you see we don't have a server rpc just yet we need to pass in our input to our server rpc so we can just copy this paste it here so player does the movement and then we pass the movement to an rpc so let's make an rpc server rpc server rpc private void move player server rpc and we pass in a vector three let's call that mouse world coordinates mouse world coordinates and so let's call this server RPC, pass in the mouse world coordinates. And then essentially here, we can copy this code to actually move the player. So see, all we're doing here is that instead of executing the code on the client, we're sending the input from the client to the server via a server RPC. And then we're having the server run that code. And so this way it's much safer. So the client can't move the character themselves by hacking into the game or cheating and you can also do extra checks on the server rpc to make sure that the client input isn't being weird so that they're not using some weird mouse bot and so that's a way to make your game more consistent and reliable by having everything handled on the server however you'll see now there are some trade-offs so we press play we put server here now let's make this a client now there is a small delay so when i so when I suddenly move my mouse, it does take a while for the snake to catch up. And this is because I'm on localhost too. So I'm running this on my local computer. So it's actually faster than being transmitted over a network. So you see, we have the client and there is a small delay. Now, how do you get past this delay? There's multiple ways. Before discussing that, I just want to show you if you go to your network manager, you can actually mimic some delay. So if you add a 50 millisecond delay here, to the packets so i put server here and i press client now it's even slower look how slow this is and so this is a way to simulate network conditions by using this debug simulator so how can we basically get rid of this lag well it's hard if you aren't using client-based movement or client-based authority for slower games such as the boss room example is completely server authoritative but the movement is much slower paced and they actually use animations and other effects to make it seem like it's actually part of the game. So they're basically hiding the lag with animations and cool effects. So that's definitely one way to do it. But obviously there are competitive games that need to be server authoritative like Call of Duty. So how do these games retain this fast movement without without giving the client a chance to cheat. And so this is the season two battle pass trailer. <laughs> and so there's a lot of different ways to do so, which are definitely more advanced. There's methods such as client side prediction, which essentially updates the client first, sends the information to the server. The server verifies that that information is correct or not correct. And if it is correct, the client is fine. However, if it's not correct, the client basically has to backtrack until their truth their version of the game is what the server is seeing so there's a lot of advanced techniques which i won't cover in this video however just be aware of them and let me know if you'd be interested in seeing these advanced techniques be implemented all right so we switched from client to server authoritative movement which is great and so essentially the last thing i want to cover is connection approval so what happens if you want to limit the amount of players in the game or do pre-processing if you go into the network manager, you'll see that there's a connection approval here, which is false. Right now, there's no approval. Anyone can join this game. So actually, let's click that and let's make a new script to approve people. So let's right click and create a new C sharp script called connection approval handler handler. We double click that. Let's erase this code that we don't need. We're going to need to use using unity.net code namespace. And so let's put how much maximum players we want. So let's say we want private const int max players equals 10. So in the start function here, we can subscribe to the network manager dot singleton dot connection approval callback. 
which is an event the network manager shoots out. And once that callback event happens, we're going to run our own check here called approval check. So let's do private void approval check. And it needs to take in some parameters. It needs to take in a network manager dot connection approval request, the request. And then it needs to take in the response. So network manager dot connection approval response. And let's call that response. And we can just put a debug.log here to make sure it's getting run. So we can just say a connection approval. And so there's a ton of things that we can check here. I'm just going to give you the simple example and then go over some other things that we can check. So we have this response that approved, which is true by default. So if it's true, that means the client can connect. And then there's a response dot reason, which we would put if they are denied for some reason. So by default, it's true. However, if we check if the network manager dot singleton dot connected clients connected clients dot count if it's greater than or equal to the amount of max players then we don't want to approve this person because the lobby is full so we can put response approved equals false and then we can do response dot reason so the reason that it is denied is that the server is full and then you can relay this information to the user they'll see that the server is full if you display it and then basically to end the function we can do response.pending equals false so this basically says okay we're done setting all these values go ahead and approve or disapprove the player so this is a super simple way and so to test it out for now we can set the max players to one so it'll show you what happens if two or more players connect i'm just going to add an empty game object and call this connection handler let's add the connection handler component let's press play here start the other instances so let's start a server start one client here client connects prefab's not spawning but we'll fix that in a minute and then the second client will not connect see the food doesn't spawn so why isn't the prefab spawning well it's because if we call this the default prefab will not get spawned so we can just put response dot player prefab hash equals to null and with this the default prefab will be used and you see that here we can set different prefab and then we also need to set the create player object to true so you see that this creates a player object for our client and this sets the prefab for the client so with that we can test it we got our server and we got our client and everything works as expected cool let's go over some of the connection handlers here are some of the things we can do in the connection handler so if we scroll down here are some other values we can change the position and rotation the player spawns at. We can get access to any additional data from the payload request that we could be sending from another scene. We can get access to the client network ID. And if we scroll down, if we want to change the player prefab, let's say we have a list of alternative prefabs. And let's say when this object spawns, it's a network behavior in this case, we can check if it's the server, then we can call the connection approval callback which in this case, they just equaled it directly, which you can also do. Let's just change ours to equal so it can match. Then here you can get the payload of this connection approval callback, which is the information that comes along with it to get a prefab index. Then we can select a prefab from our prefab index and set that to the player prefab hash. So how are they actually setting this payload information? Well, if we scroll up and call set client player prefab with an index, and then it calls network manager dot connection data and then it basically sets the connection data to the index but as a byte because you can't directly pass in this int you have to get the bytes and then convert it and then here they essentially unconvert it so that they can get that integer value from it and then they use that integer value to access the array of prefabs and set the prefab so with this way you can easily send information to the network manager to the config about how the player is supposed to look and what prefab they're supposed to have and so you see that the prefabs are a unsigned integer and you're like how can the prefabs be integers well if you scroll down they have step number two which is that your prefabs must have a network object on it and each network object will have a global object id hash so you can just copy that and that will be your link to your prefab sort of like an id so yeah that's essentially the whole game there was a lot of information so Hope you followed along. Let's do a quick recap. So we have this start network script that starts the server, the client or the host. In our case, we're going to start a server and then start two clients and have them battle it out. When the server starts, the script gets run, a food spawner, 
So it sees on server started, spawn the food, unsubscribe from the event. We initialize a network object pool, which we copied that script. So network object pool from the Unity documentation. Essentially, it's an object pool, but it's networks. So it also syncs it across all the instances. And an object pool essentially spawns items at the start. So we spawn some food. We get the networked object from the pool. We spawn it right here. We spawn it. And then we spawn over some time while there are clients connected. We keep on spawning food. And we added this function, get current prefab count. So we check if the amount of food is less than the max count. And so then the object pool, it spawns the items at the beginning. And then once the item does not need to be there anymore, we return it to the pool. So it doesn't have to keep instantiating objects constantly. It's just activating and deactivating them. Also, when a client connects, we're also checking if the amount of players is less than the maximum players. And if so, the client can connect else they can't connect. And be sure to change the max players to whatever size you want. Then we have our player controller, which manages our player and is attached to our player networked object. You see it derives from a network behavior. And so essentially on network spawn, we can initialize our player with some values, which this is called when it's spawned on the server. Then on update, we move the player. First, we check if it's the owner. So the owner of this network object, because essentially this script is being ran on all instances or all clients multiple times because there'll be multiple players spawned in a map. And this script will be running on each of those snakes or those players. However, with a network behavior, we can tell who owns this specific network object. So we check that to then move the player using server authoritative movement, which essentially we just get the input of the player and then pass it to a server RPC which is code that's called from a client, but executes on a server. So this is executed on a server. And essentially we're just moving this transform, but we're doing it on a server. And so that way it's more secure. However, there is a little delay in the movement. Vice versa, if you want client authoritative movement, you don't need to call it on a server RPC. You can just directly call the movement and then move the player. But you do have to check that the player is the owner of this script. And so then the food is spawned. And when the player crashes with the food, we want this food to increase their length. So we've made a player length script, which is also attached to our networked player object. And it's a network behavior. And essentially here, we're keeping track of the length of the snake. A network variable is a variable on the network that's synced across all instances. So we don't need any RPCs or remote procedure calls. We can also set the read and write permissions, who's able to read and write to this network variable. And so essentially when the network spawns, we get some components that we need. And then here, if we scroll down, we have some functions that change the length. So we change the network variable length and we call length changed. Length changed instantiates the tails, which this is just a function to instantiate the tails, sort the sprite renders and set extra values. And it's important to note that the tails are local to each client. They are not networked objects because it would take much more bandwidth to send the information when in reality, we can just mimic the movement of the tails on each client because they have the same behavior. And so if we go back to this food script here, when the player triggers the food, we check if it's the player. Then we check if this is a server running this function because this is going to be called on the server and the clients. So we only want the server to call this. So then we essentially add the length. This is if the food collides with the tail. And once that's added to the player, we return it to the objects pool and we despawn it from the map. So it's no longer shown and active in the network. And so essentially this is what gets called by the server and we change the length. However, since this only runs on the server, essentially we want the clients to be updated that the length have changed. So the clients, when they run their on network spawn, we perform an if statement here. So if we're not the server, subscribe to the on value changed event, then we'll call the length changed event. So if we scroll down, length changed event just calls length changed, which is the same function that's running on the server as well. So this is so that the server and all the clients can be notified to instantiate the tails. And for the tails, essentially all we're doing here is we're keeping a reference to the networked owner. Each tail will follow the previous tail, similar to a linked list. And it's a simple update where it follows the previous tail, given a distance and some delay, and then moves it over time via a lerp function from the current position to the target position. 
And so you see when we instantiate the tail, when we get that tail component, we set the networked owner, we set the previous tail, which we're keeping track of the previous tail. You see when we spawn a tail, we set the last tail to the current one that's been spawned. And then we just ignore collision between the tails and the head so that they don't crash into each other and accidentally fire the on collision enter event on the player. And so you see, we have a changed length event that's also getting called when we change our event. So you'll see that we're subscribing to that here in the UI player stats, which is attached to a canvas. And so on enable, we're just subscribing to this event. On disable, we're unsubscribing from the event. Essentially, we're just changing the length on the local client so that they can see how long their tail is. And then we have a client music player that plays an audio clip when we eat the food, which this is a singleton component. On awake, we get a reference to the audio source, and then we change the clip and play the audio source for the singleton. This is Unity code, which you can find in the description in a GIST file. We have a singleton, which is a static instance. You can access it from anywhere. Be careful when using this. I do have a video on singletons on the pros and cons. We have a persistent singleton, which basically has a do not destroy on load, and it persists across multiple scenes. We have a singleton network, which is a networked singleton, and then a singleton network persistent, which is a networked singleton, but can persist across multiple scenes. All right, and then on the player, we do an on collision enter 2D. So what happens when two player collides? First, we check if the other player is a player with a tag. Then we check if the owner of this networked object is running this function because we don't want this to be called a million times from all the scripts running this player controller. Then here is a little coroutine where we have to wait 0.5 seconds between each collision so that this function isn't run a bunch of times. And here we start that coroutine. Then if we collide head on, we can get the player length component. And so essentially we want to figure out who wins and who loses on the server. And so with that, we use a server RPC. So a server RPC is called by the client, but runs on the server. And so I put the require ownership so that any client can call this. However, in this case, we only want our client to call this. So let's actually remove that. I forgot to remove it when I was explaining the example. And so here we basically determine who's the winner and then call another server RPC. So it's still on the server. And from the server RPC, we want to tell the clients who won and who lost. So we use a client RPC. A client RPC is called by the server, runs on the client. By default, it runs on all the clients. However, you can pass in a client RPC params to specify specific clients. In this case, we made a client RPC params with our send target client IDs. We want to receive this RPC. We have an array that we declared at the top, which is a read-only ulong array. And we just set the first index to our winner. And so the winner calls the eight player client RPC, pass in the RPC params, and then we want the loser. So we replace the first index with the loser and we replace the array with the new array that has the loser. And then we call game over client RPC on the client that lost. So you see that on this client RPC, we're just checking if it's the owner. If it's the owner, you ate a player debug message. And on the game over client RPC, we check if it's the owner. We invoke some game over event, which actually is subscribed to in our UI game over script. And all it does is just enable the game over canvas. And then we shut down this instance on the network manager. And so down here, when we called the server RPC, we passed in our player data. So we can pass in the data. However, there is some restrictions. We can't just pass in a whole component. So you can pass in a client ID and a length. However, to show you, I made a custom struct. So if you want to pass in custom data, you need to serialize it. So you need to make a struct and implement the I network serializable. In this case, we want to pass the ID and length of the player. And so we declare these two values. Then we have to implement this function network serialize. And essentially we call serializer dot serialize value. And then you pass a reference to the value that you want to serialize. And you do this for all the values. So that's a basic overview of netcode for game objects. I just want to mention a few more things in the network manager. You saw for debugging, we have this debug simulator. We also have a network profiler, so we can go to window analysis profiler. So here we can check exactly what's getting run on every frame. And we scroll all the way down. We see we have NGO messages and NGO objects. And so you can actually disable certain components on the profiler. So you can just see the networked components. In this case, we want NGO messages and NGO objects. These two, I believe, are deprecated or the old versions. 
So you see we have messages and we have objects. We run the server. You'll see that now this starts to happen. Obviously nothing's happening because no data is getting sent. There's no clients connected. So let's see what happens when we connect the client. And let's just set this here. So if we press play here, we connect the client. Suddenly you'll see that there's a bunch of information. When I'm not moving, there's less information. However, when I start to move, you'll see that there's a spike in the amount of data that's getting sent over. And so you're going to want to pay close attention to this because you want to make sure you're not sending too much data. So if you actually, I missed most of it, but if you actually scroll, you can scroll over it over certain events, then it shows you exactly what data is getting sent on each frame and how many bytes. So you see 27 bytes and this has 19 bytes. So we can expand this and you can see exactly what's getting set. So we have a network variable delta message that's getting set here. So let me try to do this in a better way here. All right, so I pause the server. We can actually scroll through all of these in more detail. You see this at this green spike, server RPC message being called. Then here we can see our client is calling move player server RPC. And so with this, you can see exactly what's getting called and when and how many bytes it's sending. You see bytes received, 20 bytes received. And so with this, you can see what data is getting sent on each frame, which can be really useful for debugging, but also seeing how many bytes you're sending. So on the network, you're going to want to reduce the amount of bytes you're sending as much as possible, because the more data you send, the longer it will take to reach the client. And so I just want to emphasize here on this debug simulator, it's also important to test this with different values. So I did explain this in the beginning. But the delay is how much time it takes to receive a package. A jitter basically adds some randomness to the time it takes to receive a message. And so the drop rate randomly drops packages. And so those packages might need to be resent. We go to the player controller and go to a server RPC. When we required ownership, there's also a delivery method here, which you can set reliable or unreliable. Remember at the beginning, I was saying the difference between TCP and UDP. UDP just sends out the packages and is like, I hope you get it. But TCP actually makes sure you receive the packages, which can also take some more extra time because you have to verify that the end connection is receiving these packages. And so you can actually change those parameters as needed. Unity has documentation. If you'd like to check that out, you can see the pro under bad network conditions, a reliable package is guaranteed. However, the con is that the sender will continue to send a reliable package if it does not get that package received. And if you have too many reliable packages being sent, it can cause additional bandwidth overhead. And so with the debug simulator, you can check different conditions. So let's say you have a really fast paced game and you only want to have maybe 10 or 20 milliseconds of delay and you can add some extra jitter or an extra drop rate. This might be pretty laggy though for an FPS. And then for more casual games, you can allow more milliseconds to pass, such as turn-based games, since the turns are not very frequent. Like in Boss Room, it's a much slower game. They use animations to cover up the lag. And finally, as part of the multiplayer tools package, we have a runtime network stats monitor. So make sure you have com.unity.multiplayer.tools installed, which also lets you access the profiler. So I already have it installed here. So you can click runtime net stats monitor and just add that to any script here. And you can also change where you want it to be positioned. So I'm going to position it on the right here. And we're going to press play. And so if we start the server, you'll see that nothing's really getting sent yet. However, if we start a client here, you'll see that now there are data starting to be sent, which is a little hard to see. But you can see here RTT is round trip time. So how much time it takes to get to the server and back. It shows you the amount of bytes that are sent in kilobytes per second. It also shows you the milliseconds of the round trip to time. It shows you how many packets are being sent and received, and it shows you how many RPCs are being sent and received. So if we collect some food. You'll see that this will slowly update. It's a little hard to see. You can also add a custom style sheet or panel settings override to make it easier to see. Additionally, there is a network simulator, but you do need netcode 1.1.0 or later, and you also need the multiplayer tools 1.1.0 or later. So if we want to access this, we need the Unity Transport 2.0.0, which is a newer version, and it only supports Unity version 2022.2 and later. So I personally cannot use it in this project. However, it's really cool. You can simulate different network conditions. You can trigger lag spikes and you can simulate different network conditions as well. So I know I recommended 2021.3 because it is the most stable one. 
However, they are adding features onto later LTSs. So hopefully 2022 LTS comes out soon so that we can get all these nice features. But I do have the same project open here on 2023 version. So just to show you what that's like. So I'm going to go here into my 2023 version, enable pre-release packages, understand. And then I'll be able to see different versions in the version history. I'm going to update it and hope for the best. All right. Now, once you have that installed, which you see, it did low key break everything and did break everything. So that's great. I love it. Um, so maybe it's not just quite ready yet for usage. But if someone can figure this out, that'd be awesome. Just put it in the comments below. I'm going to downgrade this. All right, so that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I know it was a really long video, but hopefully you learned a lot in the process. And if you did, make sure to like and subscribe. I did put a lot of work into this. And thank you to Unity for sponsoring this video. The source code is available for patrons, which I would like to thank them as well for all of their support. I said I was going to make a multiplayer video quite a long time ago when we reached a goal and it did take some time. However, I wanted to wait for netcodes to be out and a little more stable. And so here it finally is. I hope you enjoyed it. And special thank you to Jedi Link, Antonioni and Dennis for subscribing to the higher Patreon tiers. And thank you for all the support as always. Link is in the description if you're interested. I offer exclusive content, source code for my videos, early access and more. And so if you haven't already, make sure to join our Discord where you can chat, post memes or ask for help. And so let me know what you guys thought. Thanks so much for watching and well, I'll see you next time.